Yo. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Nostalgia. What a bizarre emotion. The dictionary defines it as a wistful desire to return in thought or in fact to a former time in one's life, to one's home or homeland, or to one's family and friends. A sentimental yearning for the happiness of a former place or time is a feeling we all at some point in our lives understand intrinsically. As long as man has had the ability to remember, we've had this gift, curse, sense. It is in truth neither good nor bad, but objective reality. The fractured pieces of what is, what was, and what may never be again. Shattered pieces of a mirror scatter shot in the recesses of our minds. Nostalgia is like a raven's shadow hanging over us. A reminder nothing lasts forever. Those days next to ones you love. Those afternoons watching or playing games or films that were so important to you. Not even those nights in which you longed for what was just to be again. All eventually fades, shatters, dies. Just as the sun and moon shall rise and fall, so too shall every moment you ever have. Every joyous victory, every exciting race, every silence that came of heartbreak, all is faded to end. So, bearing all that in mind, what would it mean for someone to criticize such a universal concept? to analyze the past of both oneself as well as the collective, to review the shattered memories of the masses, to assess one's feelings firmly under the watchful eye of the raven, to remember it so you don't have to. Well, I suppose to start, they'd probably call you the Nostalgia Critic. But first, before we go into this deep dive through internet history and beyond, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. If there is one thing that several of these episodes of Internet Fables has taught us, is that keeping your privacy on the internet is very important. And with ExpressVPN, you can do just that and more. ExpressVPN protects your private information from nefarious figures big or small on the web. It does this by encrypting your network data with best-in-class encryption. Through this, ExpressVPN is also able to stop your ISP or internet service provider from selling your information and data to ad companies as well as it stops them from being able to see your browsing history. ExpressVPN also gives you unrestricted access to all parts of the internet, being able to access shows or videos that are normally region locked. As someone who uses a VPN pretty much all the time for all these reasons and more, 
I highly recommend you check out ExpressVPN. Just click the link down below and when you use my link you'll get your first three months of ExpressVPN completely free. A humongous thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. But now, the review must go on. The year, like so many other entries in this series, was 2007. Steve Jobs had just announced and revealed the revolutionary iPhone. J.K. Rowling had just finished and released the final book in her popular Harry Potter series. Games like Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, Portal, Bioshock, Team Fortress 2, Halo 3, Mass Effect, Crisis, and a Wii Sports were the talk of the town. And of course, this little site called YouTube was getting pretty damn popular. And one of the most popular content creators of his time was in his prime at this point, James Rolfe, otherwise known as the Angry Video Game Nerd, who was at this point actively creating season two of his landmark series. One that we have seen across this series had a knock-on effect of inspiring others to try and do something similar. That is, review video games in a disgruntled fashion, to say the least. This is my PlayStation 2. This is my Xbox One. This is my Xbox 360. And this right here is my PlayStation 3 and this is what, what I like to call the Nintendo Shit Cube and the reason I call it the Nintendo Shit Cube because it's a piece of fucking shit! Enter the protagonist of our story, the hero of this fable among fables, Douglas Darian Walker. Born on November 17th of 1981 to father Barney Walker, a naval officer and musician, and Sander Walker, a former opera singer and therapist. Doug Walker spawned on a naval base in the Naples. Italy, and moved frequently as a child, spending parts of his childhood in Rhode Island, Washington, and Jacksonville, Florida, before eventually moving to Chicago, Illinois area in his teen years. He grew up alongside his older brother Rob, and would later attend and graduate from Northern Illinois University, majoring in mass communication and minoring in visual art, also serving as an editor and cartoonist for the school newspaper. Doug would also study film while in college as it was one of his passions. After finishing his college, he worked as a janitor and later as an illustrator to earn a living. While on the side, Doug would take an interest in online content, specifically those that could be found on YouTube. This interest would eventually lead to Doug making a couple of videos himself, the first of which being Five Second Movies. Five Second Movies was a pretty basic concept. All it was is showing a five second clip of a film usually with a joke or a quick punchline to summarize the film as seen here. Lisa called John John Binks. Lisa, your humble servant. I got a bad feeling about this. I'm happy. No, you're not. You're right. <laughs> Boy, did I bet on the wrong horse. These videos, while simple, did gain a bit of attention as a quick and punchy bit of content that was easy to share around. Doug made these as a quick joke and had no idea it would end up getting so popular so quickly. And so it was in this moment, with this small little piece of popularity, this glimmer of being viral, 
where a spark popped off in Doug's head. He had an idea. An idea that would come to define his life going forward. An idea that so too would come to inspire others. An idea that would be his legacy. This is the shit! So it starts off like that copter was taken down years ago. <laughs> and then they're like, get out of the copter or we'll shoot. And then he's like, wow! Well, it's a transformer, you know, it's just it's so cool! And he's just like, <laughs> everyone's like, ah! <laughs> and there's this kid, you know, he's trying to get laid, and so he buys this car. And it's like the coolest car in the world! It like knows how to pick up chicks! How can a car know how to pick up chicks? So he's driving around, he picks up this hot chick and stuff, the car's doing like all the work, I don't know how it does it. And then there's this lame line, you know, there's more to you than meets the eye, and everyone, oh, you know, okay. But then the car is like, wow! Transformer 2! What you're looking at is the very first episode of Doug's iconic series, The Nostalgia Critic. Released on YouTube on July 3rd, 2007, this video is interesting because, for one, it's Doug Walker's first appearance on camera, and already so many features of the character, of the critic, is here on display, like that of the black cap and black suit blazer, his iconic goatee and glasses, though I suppose he had that, you know, even before the character, but all the same, what is not so similar is the way that the video is presented, that being a very frantic and then like this and this and so on and so forth type of commentary plays out, which will come up again later, but is pretty different from the series norm to come. <laughs> And all the people are like, ah! and then they're like, protect the cube. <laughs> and the girl's like, whatever happens today, I'm glad I stepped in that car. And While this may be the pilot episode, I'd argue that it was the second video Doug would make under the series title of Nostalgia Critic that would come to define the series, the character of the critic, and the general format of said series. That video being Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, Nostalgia Critic, which opens with the character's famous catchphrase. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. I remember it so you don't have to. No matter what anyone says, that is one of the best opening lines for a series like this. It perfectly captures the goal, the tone, and basic idea for this series. That being this guy, the Nostalgia Critic, reviewing old movies from his past. Perhaps from your past as well, and critiquing them so that you don't have to. It's a fun premise for a show, and honestly is not all that different from the core premise of the angry video game nerd. You know, the guy who's gonna take you back to the past to play the shitty games that suck ass. Uh, more on that in a bit. This first major review I distinctly remember watching back in the day. I would have been around 12 or 13 at the time, and I don't actually remember what the first video of Doug's was that I saw, but I do remember that I started watching him because of the angry video game nerd and Nostalgia Critic crossover event, which again, we'll get to in a bit. But I do remember that this was one of the first videos that I did see from him, and I remember laughing pretty hard once the actual premise of this film that he was reviewing was revealed. He talks about how this big cartoon event was a big deal at the time, and how every boy and girl at the time were very excited for it. He said they were going to do a half hour special featuring kids' favorite cartoons, you name it, DuckTales, Chipmunks, Looney Tunes, Ninja Turtles, the works. When you're a kid, this is the equivalent of like Elvis meets the Beatles. I mean, the world could just explode right there. So for weeks, we've been waiting in anticipation and finally the big day came before eventually finally revealing the premise of the special. So, now that all our favorite cartoon characters are together in one spot, what are they gonna talk about? Marijuana. Scoozy? Marijuana. D Did Simon of the Chipmunks just say marijuana? What? What would possess Simon of the Chipmunks to say marijuana? No, 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 this, this has got to be some kind of mistake. It, it can't be the same marijuana we're thinking of. An unlawful substance used to experience artificial highs. Oh my god. What? Why is Simon the Chimlets talking about marijuana? What? What kind of slap in the face is that? I mean, Simon shouldn't know what marijuana is. 
Simon is one of the embodiments of childhood. He's from out in the chipmunks for crying out loud. Jesus, I feel so dirty. Simon the chipmunks just said marijuana. Is there any other American icon that can smash the foundations of my childhood any quicker? What's this? A joint? Why does Bugs Bunny know what a joint is? Bugs Bunny shouldn't know what a joint is. If Bugs Bunny knows what a joint is, that means he knows what drugs are. If Bugs Bunny knows what drugs are, that means the rest of the Looney Tunes know what drugs are. And if the rest of the Looney Tunes know what drugs are, well that just explains your goddamn much! As someone who had never heard of this special, as I'm sure many weren't at the time of this video's release, I remember being absolutely shocked that this thing existed. Now, the video itself is only seven and a half minutes, and the critic pretty quickly comes over the rest of the special, mostly just noting the basic plot and showcasing any time the characters talk about drugs. But that's all the video really needed to be. Just a guy showcasing and mocking a weird special that he remembered from his past. Doug's sense of humor and personality for the critic character are also showcased here. Oh, and look, the first time we see the gun he's always so well known for having. Because, uh, he's a critic, you see, and critics have guns, I guess. The video also has the angry man on the internet appeal that was so very popular at this time, with the critic later ranting about how over the top and hammered in the message of the special is. So, okay, what exactly are these cartoon characters trying to tell us? There's nothing cool about a fool on drugs. Eh, fair enough, I guess. So the next time the- Watch up, Doc, is your life if you don't cut it out. Okay. You're excellent just the way you are. Got it. We don't always see things the way they are. Okay. Uh, just believe in yourself. Well, I, we care about you. Well, maybe. Uh, Everyone's got problems, kid. Yeah. Why don't you just say no? Got it. You gotta believe in yourself. Will you shut up? Listen to us. Yeah, I heard you. You use, you lose. Okay, God. You know, I thought this would be really cool, but you know what? This really blows. All my cartoon characters are fucking narcs. Now, after this, the next video in this series would be a Cloverfield trailer reaction, which kind of stands out. In fact, a fair few of these oldest videos stand out in the series as they really have nothing to do with a nostalgia, especially at the time a brand new movie that hadn't even come out yet, which I guess it is ironically enough now a bit nostalgic. But this video is still very much a showcase of the character, with him trying to figure out what the hell the movie of Cloverfield is about. What does the monster in the movie look like? Or whatever is attacking New York, with him manically reacting to it and throwing out harebrained theories. I mean, what could it be? What on earth could that giant thing that blows up buildings and throws the head of the Statue of Liberty everywhere be? Is it a demon? Is it a machine? Is it Donkey Kong? My money's on Donkey Kong. After he gets drunk on all those barrels of beer, he rampages through the city, seeking out all the Italian plumbers. Or, you know, it is J.J. Abrams. Maybe it's the Black Smoke from Lost. He got off the island, and now he's looking for a nice industrial plant to call home. No, no, I bet it's J.J. Abrams' production logo, the Bad Robot. He goes stomping through the city, looking for the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Because there's only room for one giant homicidal corporate logo in this town. Maybe it's not a monster at all. Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe he just wanted to give the Bible a twist ending and decides to rampage through the city. Maybe it's all four of them. Maybe it's a giant robotic Donkey Kong Jesus riding a puff of smoke. Holy shit, that'd be really cool. This, I think, was Doug testing the waters, playing around with this new character for fun, and then maybe see what sticks as well. But after that video, Doug would make one final alteration to his character's, uh, look. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Ah, uh, yes. We finally get his iconic white t-shirt and red tie. This ensemble, like that of the nerd's white shirt full of pens and brown pants, would become the critic's official outfit, it all at once again being quite iconic. Now funnily enough, the video on the official channel Awesome channel here only has audio uh, coming out of the left ear, so I don't know if that was an issue with the initial upload back when it came out all the way back in 2007, or if this was a re-upload error? But regardless, just thought that I'd point that out. Anyway, this video is alright. It is mostly just the critic dunking on Power Rangers and pointing out the 
as jumps in logic in the film. After this, we get one of the more random things that he did, and again, what I think to be a bit of experimentation on his part. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. I'm here in Oak Park, Illinois, where we are witnessing the largest gathering in Illinois, if not the United States, of Harry Potter fans who have all gathered here together to celebrate the release of the new Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Dorky Hollows, the uh, Deadly Hollows. Nostalgia Critic at the Harry Potter book launch in Oak Park, Illinois. Basically, this is a video of Doug Walker, in character of the Nostalgia Critic, going around and interviewing trolling and making fun of Harry Potter fans at the midnight release of the final book. It is pretty funny in places, and honestly is kind of ballsy that he ran around in full character like this, poking fun at people and... Yeah, honestly this one is pretty funny, especially for what is so clearly an off-the-cuff spontaneous thing. Alright, so what exactly is your job here tonight? Making sure that everyone's in the right line, in the right place, and that nobody's fighting over your spot. We've had some uh, arguments. No, I mean, no, you know, no brawls. No fists. No. Nope you fits. haven't had to break out the hairy bats. No, no, no hairy bats. Do you have hairy bats? <laughs> Everybody's dressed up here. I haven't seen so many wizards and fairies since last year's gay pride parade. Now, there's a rumor going around that you're actually the son of Mary Poppins of Where's Waldo. What do you think about that? Now, I gotta ask you, um, what poor sheep died to give you that beard? He also randomly meets up with the founders of MuggleNet, which was this super big Harry Potter fan site at the time that I distinctly remember going to every once in a while back in the day, especially back before the last book came out. We also get this rather iconic scream, that oh so familiar sound of a hyena getting anally assaulted by an elephant. Ah, yes. Marvelous. Now, I'm not gonna go over every single video that Doug has ever made, but these next few I would like to highlight a few things moving forward. First of all, the next video in the series would be the top 11 scariest nostalgic moments. The first of what would become one of his more popular types of nostalgia critic videos, and some of my very favorites growing up. There is something so alluring about the top 10 list, something that in our monkey brains just pops off when one sees a list, be it opinionated or no. Hell, even ranking and tier list and iceberg videos are kind of like list videos but in a different format. All the same though, Doug once again opens this video with a rather cool catchphrase, that being why he does top 11s instead of top 10s. Why top 11? Because I like to go one step beyond. I swear this type of stuff just comes naturally to Doug, and was a good hook for his top 11 lists going forward. That being said, this list is only alright. It's mostly about scenes from kids movies that are a bit off kilter or spooky, thus the nostalgic scary moments. I can't relate since I ended up watching slasher movies and seeing imagery from real horror movies much earlier than most I'd say, but it's still a fun watch. Next we get the review of the Super Mario Bros movie, the film that it seemed damn near every reviewer on the internet took a swing at back in the day. You know, looking back, they definitely colored my opinions on a lot of this stuff, because as an adult, I actually think the Super Mario Bros movie is pretty cool. Not great, but still decent and has some really great atmosphere and art design. Is it Mario Bros? No, not at all. But as its own thing, it's not nearly as bad as many of these reviewers would have you think, at least in my opinion. That being said, there is a clear structure starting to form in this series. That being the critic opening the video with his catchphrase, then going over in a fairly quick fashion the history and time frame of whatever film he's reviewing's release, while also kind of talking in a collective manner. That being, we all were shitting our pants over this one, or we couldn't believe that this was real, which is an interesting choice, instead of him saying, I. I think the reason he chose to speak this way was because, again, he is the nostalgia critic. 
he's reviewing things that you grew up with, that you may have a memory of. Sort of with this sense of authority, but also as the everyman about how people, and indeed himself, generally feel about the film. There is some acting for the camera as well, but what's interesting about this premise is that I grew up watching some of the movies he would end up reviewing, but there were just as many, if not far more, that I had yet to see or had even heard of at this point. Which meant when he spoke in these terms, such as, we all felt this way, it took on a bit of a different meaning for me. That being that he was telling people like me who don't remember, who didn't grow up with this stuff, who have no nostalgia or memories with these things, that this is how people that did watch those things and do have nostalgia for them feel about them. Now while this may all sound like I'm explaining the obvious to some, I want to point this out because I think it's one of the early core appeals of the series from both the standpoint of the familiar and the unfamiliar. For the familiar, it's a walk down memory lane as well as a sense of catharsis, with the critic cutting into this old stuff from one's childhood for fun. And for those unfamiliar, it's an interesting look at things that were people's childhoods, and again, a fun way of cutting through them from a cynical adult critic's eyes. Another part of the structure that's starting to form is the linear analysis of the film, that being going from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie and commentating and critiquing as one goes along. A format that, while obviously inspired by quite a few things from the past, was a structure for the internet by and large that Doug created. Anyway, the next video is a follow-up to his Cloverfield Theory video, where he finally finds out what the thing in the movie is about. And a Cloverfield is about a monster, which he then proceeds to yell about for several minutes. Which is funny because I thought everyone, including himself, figured it was about a monster destroying stuff. But, uh, whatever, I guess, suppose. <laughs> Next couple of videos sees the critic reviewing the Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat films, and tearing into them endlessly. Which is funny because at least one of them would serve as inspiration for him in a, uh, a future project, shall we say. Also, he keeps complaining that there are a lot of fight scenes in a film called Street Fighter and a film called Mortal Kombat, both based on fighting video games, even calling all the fight scenes pointless, which, uh, is certainly a take one could have, I guess. Now, there are two more mainline videos that Doug would create for this series after that. One being a review of Space Jam, which is uh, pretty famous for this whole joke. Lola. Oh, wait, 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 I remember from the classic Lola cartoons. You know, with the... and the... Who the fuck's Lola? Lola, turns out, is a girl bunny they created to bring in more of the female demographic. Unfortunately, they didn't really make her fun, silly, goofy, or zany. In fact, they didn't give her any personality at all. They just tried to pose her off as some sort of strange sex symbol. Which is kind of weird, because she is, in fact, a rabbit. She's not a person, she's a rabbit. If it was a person, maybe it would make a little bit more sense to make her a sex symbol, but she is, in fact, a rabbit. Why would I want to fuck a rabbit? What sense does that make? Rabbits aren't sexy, rabbits are food! I mean, look at her. They dress her in skimpy clothes, they make her wear short shorts. Oh, and here's the biggest insult of all. They actually gave her bunny boobies. Bunny boobies! I mean, what kind of sick, twisted pervert actually gives a cartoon character bunny boobies? I mean, if that Hoss and Pfeffer hussy actually has female genitalia, what does that mean the other Looney Tune characters have? Oh my god, ball! Stop! Stop! Okay, all right, let me make one thing perfectly clear to all you Warner Brothers representatives out there. We don't want to fuck bunnies. I can't believe I have to say this. We don't want to fuck bunnies. I mean, we're people. Therefore, we like to fuck other people. I'm sure there's some small percentage of people out there that like to fuck bunnies, but that hardly seems like a very profitable demographic. Oh, you 
Sweet, sweet summer child. And the other being the first Pokemon movie, which just amounts to the critic yelling, Look how weird and confusing Pokemon is for someone who had never seen it before, for 13 minutes. But you'll notice that at the bottom of this video, there is some text that reads, ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com. And there is a significant reason for this being here. One which takes us into our next chapter. So a bit of context is needed here. In case you somehow didn't notice by now, the Nostalgia Critic reviews movies, and often uses clips from said movies as a means of illustrating his points, adding to his jokes, or just generally being a visual aid so that you know what the hell he's talking about. Well, movie reviews are infamously difficult even to this day on YouTube, as they can easily be copyright claimed or blocked by the copyright holders of said film. Now, many savvy YouTubers have found ways around this while still being able to show some clips of the film, usually by means of using very short five or so second clips, cutting it up a lot, using stills, etc as a means of using their fair use. Well, back in early YouTube land, things were far worse, usually. I mean, maybe you could more easily get away with AMVs featuring insert popular song of the time, but most movie reviews or anything of that sort was usually quickly destroyed from the site. And while these days copyright holders often copyright claim a video, meaning that it stays up but they get the money from the views, or maybe if they're more stringent, they'll copyright block it so that no one can watch it. The third, and almost no one uses this option these days, is to copyright strike the channel, which means the video is taken down, and you now have a strike on your channel for the next week or month or so, depending on the situation. And remember, if your channel at any point gets three copyright strikes in a row, the channel is kaput. Well, I'm sure you might know where this story is going. This exact fate happened to Doug Walker's channel. But there is a rather interesting extra part of the story that I have yet to hear anyone else point out. See, going back through the Wayback Machine, we can see Doug's old channel, what it looked like, etc. But anyone who knows how YouTube works is sure to notice something rather odd about the way he used his primary channel. There are only two videos on this channel, one titled Icon, which was how he got his channel icon since that's how you had to uh, get your avatar back then. And then the other video is titled, All My Videos Are In The Favorite Section. A capture before this capture shows that the video was also originally titled, How This Channel Works. This was also repeated in the channel's description from both captures. Same goes for this other channel, 5 Second Films. And if you were to go and look into his favorite section, you'll notice that every single video from this series is in his favorites, like he says. But then in addition, every single video in this series up to this point has its own separate channel that the video is uploaded to and named after. Now, when I saw this, I genuinely couldn't believe what I was seeing. I had never seen someone use a channel like this before, or set up a separate channel for each of their videos, which sounded like a tedious headache of a process. Well, turns out there is a reason for this strange setup. It's because this is actually Doug's second channel, as some of you might have noted that its creation date comes a few months after when the first Nostalgia Critic video was made. You see, the first channel to host these episodes was simply titled Nostalgia Critic, while the second one was called THE Nostalgia Critic. And as you might imagine, his first channel was taken down due to multiple copyright strikes, which at the time, YouTube had no real way of combating or having any say in. Remember, this was a time before monetization and people looking to make YouTube into a career, and it was way before YouTube had any real reason to give any sort of shit about YouTubers being copyright claimed, since they also had no real money in that game at first either. So despite it, for its time, popularity on the site, Doug's channel was taken down 
both for his Nostalgia Critic reviews and his five second movies. Which is ironic because now a video that only uses five seconds of a film would be more than easily considered fair use and wouldn't even be picked up by the copyright bots, more than likely. A lot of people like to glorify how YouTube worked back in the day, and there certainly were a lot of very cool things that Unfortunately, we're kind of lost to time as the website modernized. However, what was not so cool and should not be glorified is how copyright claims worked in general. While it may not be perfect today, it is still far better than what it once was. Where even something as simple and dumb as five seconds of a film for a joke was considered a copyright strikeable offense. And Doug wasn't even the only example of this. James Rolfe also ran into similar trouble with this, with his one-off Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles review as well, with it becoming a screw attack exclusive for years due to how dangerous it would have been to upload said video to his main channel. Now, unfortunately, the Wayback Machine doesn't have any captures of Doug's original channel before it got nuked. But what's interesting to note here is that Doug came up with a pretty interesting idea to try and combat the copyright strike at first glance, since his channel would favor all the mainline videos while the dummy channels would each host a video individually. That way, if one got copyright struck, one would only need to make another channel and favorite the video again. This is extremely time consuming and very inconvenient, but hey, it seemed like a pretty damn good idea. That way, no matter what, your main channel doesn't get taken down and there's always an easy place to find all your videos. And it did work for a bit, but it was a temporary fix, something that ultimately couldn't be sustained forever. And indeed, at some point, this second channel would also be taken down via copyright violations, even though it technically didn't upload any of these videos, which is uh, pretty wild to say the least. But before that happened, Doug would need to find a solution to his ever-present copyright issue. He had an audience that loved his content, that wanted to see more, but he needed to find a way for his content to be viewable at all. And luckily for Doug, before his second channel would go out of commission, he would find this solution. If YouTube wouldn't host his content, then he would make his own website. TGWTG.com, shorthand for that guy with the glasses.com, named after the moniker Doug went by at the end of his videos. This would end up being the home base for all future content for Doug Walker for the foreseeable future. Now bear in mind, this was back in 2008, back when YouTube wasn't this all-seeing, all-powerful video platform that no one could possibly have a hope to compete with just yet. But nonetheless, striking out on one's own, especially so early in his career, was a brave and confident move all the same. But I suppose with how YouTube worked at the time, it was his only real choice to boldly flee from the site at that point. That guy with the glasses.com was first formed in April of 2008 with the help of Mike Michaud, who was a friend of Doug's and would end up building the site as well as becoming the CEO of a new company called Channel Awesome, the kind of overarching company that they formed for the site. It was actually Mashad who first approached Doug with the idea to create a website in early April 2008, since YouTube was causing Walker problems. Mashad would also work as an administrator for the site, responsible for its upkeep, uploads, etc. He was, and in many ways, still is the man in the shadows. The man behind the man, if that makes sense. And we'll come back to him at a later point. The newly formed company would be headed up by Mike, Doug, and his brother Rob, who also had a moniker at the time, commonly known as The Other Guy. Quite a few years later, at some point, Rob Walker would actually answer a question regarding the creation of the ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com website and what inspired them to create this site to begin with, as well as going into the mindset of where Doug was before he started making The Nostalgia Critic and during its primordial soup phase of sorts. Quote, It was sort of organic, not really spur of the moment, not totally planned either. Before he did any of this, Doug went through like a mid-midlife crisis. 
He got big into all the things he watched as a child, including ordering a DVD of old 80s commercials. Of the shows and movies he tracked down, some still held up, some did not. Some things I didn't recognize at all, but there was a two year age difference, so occasionally we saw something the other missed. Point being, he made it his quest to track down old things he remembered, and I constantly made fun of him for it. Finally, I asked him when this whole freaky phase was going to pass, and he said, Now, I think I'm done. I'm all out. So that nostalgia thing was definitely there, but that was one or two years before any of this. Fast forward since then. The first thing was 5 second movies, which was a fluke, in that we had no idea it would take off on YouTube. Doug did it as a joke. Next, Doug found Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue. He had totally forgotten about it and found it hilarious. He wanted to try his hands at reviewing something. For a while, I think he wanted to exercise his inner Lewis Black. We used to film stuff all the time in high school and college, and I think he was just rediscovering how fun it could be. Eventually it spread to the Transformers review, and then the Harry Potter event just happened to occur. Over time, he found his style for reviewing nostalgic crap. I think the idea came from various Generation X sites that posted humorous written reviews of 80s stuff. We looked at each other, kinda pissed, and said, This situation sucks. We can do this. We loved and hated this stuff. If only we had the means. Eventually, Mike Michaud and Walker's college friends, Bargoff and Mike Ellis, said they were looking for a product to support as the first step in their glorious plans to create Channel Awesome. Mike offered to build the site. We would use the moniker Doug had on YouTube, that guy with the glasses. At some point, most of Doug's work on YouTube was being done to get a fan base going. The idea was, when we have enough fans, we'd launch the site. At that time, though, Mike's scheme was only one of like four things Doug had on his plate. So it started off slow, and Mike wanted to make sure the site was perfect before launch." Unquote. This answer also gave fans a bit more of a closer look into the mindset Doug was in when he made the series to begin with that of a crazed midlife midlife crisis, sadly already starting to bald, 20-something year old man. Passionate, maybe even in some ways desperate, to look back at his past, what made him who he is today. To what end, I suppose only Doug knows fully. But what can be said of it all, is this group of brothers and friends all came together, with some helpful encouragement from YouTube no longer being a viable option for their uh, creative endeavors, and thus that guy with the glasses.com was born. And funnily enough, in June of 2008, every single one of Doug's videos were found and deleted from YouTube, which Doug actually didn't mind at this point, because as if the very stars aligned, the website was fully ready to go at that point, and he had a trailer to showcase this site's launch. Uh, bear in mind, I had to change the audio of this trailer due to the song and it being copyright claimed. Ironic, I know, but um, here it is anyway. Thank you. 
Now, all that being said, as we go through this retrospective, I'll be detailing more and more about that guy with the glasses.com and the other characters introduced there as well. But for now, I will say that looking at this site, as silly as it sounds, genuinely brings back so many good, nostalgic memories for me. The way the site is presented, all the content that I remember. It's just good vibes overall. And hell, uh, I'm even willing to admit that there was a time in my life where I visited thatguyoftheglasses.com more often than I did YouTube. And if you know how much I watch YouTube, you know that that's saying something. My reason for this goes far beyond just the nostalgia critic content, however, as there were a lot of extremely creative, innovative, and interesting figures, shall we say, that would come to be hosts on this website. But again, we'll go over all that stuff later. All the same though, this was the hub for Doug Walker's content moving forward, including two brand new series. One being called Bum Reviews, and the other being Ask That Guy With The Glasses. Starting with the former, Bum Reviews is, um, uh, well, perhaps it's best I just show you a quick clip or two. Oh my god, this is the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life! There's this kid named Speed Racer. Someone actually named it Speed Racer. I can't believe that. What cruel parents. And he likes to go driving and dress up like a sperm, which is why they call him Sperm Racer. And he is in a classroom drawing. The drawings come to life and suddenly he is a race car driver. And there are so many beautiful things flying at him. Big lights, pretty pictures. It was kind of like being on drugs, except I wasn't on drugs. I'm watching this movie thinking, I'm be on drugs, but I looked and I wasn't on drugs. It's like drugs without drugs. It's that good! If you're not high by the time you go into this movie, you definitely will be by the time you leave. Oh my god, this is the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life! There's this bear who wants to be a kung fu master, and I think he's the bear from those Panda Express restaurants. And so he climbs these stairs and enters this big Chinese place to become the kung fu panda. Pandas will do that. I had an artwork that took up tap dancing until I ate him. And there's a female tiger known as Tigress, and there's a female snake known as Snake. What do you this series features Doug dressed up as Chester A. Bum, and since the Nostalgia Critic was all about reviewing movies from the past, Doug made this character to review movies currently coming out. Though reviewing is used rather loosely here. Some of you might have noticed that this crazy maniac review style is very similar to the very first Nostalgia Critic episode where he was reviewing the then new Transformers film, which is interesting. I'll be honest with you, I never was the biggest fan of this series, as I thought the joke was kind of one note. And while there was occasionally a clever bit of commentary thrown in there, it's one of Doug Walker's weaker ideas in my opinion. Maybe this show had its fans, and if you're one of them, please feel free to comment down below what you enjoy about Bum Reviews. Because for me, rewatching these, even though each are only three to four minutes in length, they are some of the longest three to four minutes I have ever had to suffer through. There's this guy called Hellboy, except he's not really a boy. He is a big angry man with pepperoni coming out of his head. And he teams up with this fish man, who kind of looks like the creature from the Blue Lagoon, if he was gay. And there is this woman who can control fire, and most of the time she's covered in fire. I know you expect me to make a sexual joke about how attractive she is. Ooh, she's so hot, she's so hot she's on fire, she's so hot she's steaming. But I'd like to think I moved past that childish humor. Back to the review. This series also has a opening catchphrase. That being, this is the best movie I've ever seen in my life. But besides that, it's just Doug screaming at me pretending to be a dim-witted bum while describing a movie with the occasional comments. It's just not very funny to me, and in general, it's just not the type of atmosphere that I wish to stay within for very long. On the other hand, I'll tell you what is my taste in Ambiance. Ask that guy with the glasses. Oh, hello. Didn't hear you come in. 
Greetings and welcome to Ask That Guy with the Glasses. The premise of this show is people ask that guy with the glasses questions and he answers them. Seems pretty simple really. In fact, based on that premise alone, if you knew nothing about it, you might expect it to be a simple Q&A show where Doug answers people's questions since he went by the moniker of that guy with the glasses online. However, in a rather interesting creative decision, this is actually a brand new character. That guy with the glasses could almost be described as this Luciferian, all-knowing, spiteful, crazy, vindictive, perverted, disgusting to his very core, a gentleman of high culture that is an absolute joy to hear answer pretty much any type of question. Once I was playing Super Mario 64, and in Super Mario 64, you have to jump in a painting to start the level, and so I did. My little brother saw it and he asked me how that was possible, and I told him it's possible because it's a video game. He went crazy and is now scared of paintings. What should I do? Sacrifice him to your god. Whether it be Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, or what have you, just sacrifice him. Because all great religions agree that life is a sacrifice. And what better way to prove it than to sacrifice the innocent? As the old saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, sacrifice. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Sacrifice. If you found yourself trapped in an underground Egyptian chamber, how would you escape if you only had a revolver and a pen to help you? I forgot to mention that the chamber is filled with transvestite scorpions and radioactive monkeys. That's a very good question. Actually, no it isn't. It is the worst question I have ever been asked in my entire life. Shame on you. My advice is to kill yourself and burn in the fiery flames of hell. Trust me, you will be doing the world and yourself much good. I have trouble sleeping. What do you recommend I do to get a good night's sleep? That's a very good question. Have you tried lying down, covering yourself with sheets, and perhaps closing your eyes? That usually helps with me. And may I also recommend dreaming. Dreaming does wonders for sleep. And you can imagine all sorts of things. I had a dream once that I was a porcupine. A porcupine, can you imagine? Yes. I also love the catchphrase that comes at the very end of every episode. This is that guy with the glasses saying, there's no such thing as a stupid question until you ask it. Maybe I'm a bit biased, as I just have a thing for ultra-classy gentlemen with an absolutely sick and twisted side at their core. But in general, the writing here seems to be much more natural for Doug, and it's also very different from Nostalgia Critic and his other stuff since it's not based around films. And sometimes the questions get rather dark and deeply personal sounding as well, almost uncomfortably so. Last night, I forgot to lock the door to my room when I was preparing myself to jerk off. All of a sudden, in the middle of my pleasure, my brother busted in and caught me in the act. I'm worried he'll tell my mom or dad about it and I'll get the talk. Any advice on how to prevent my brother from telling my parents? <laughs> you don't have to worry about that at all. I'll give you the talk. You see, when a man and a woman love each other very, very much, and then, of course, she will say things to you, like, what part of restraining order didn't you understand? And you'll say to yourself, why is this bitch getting to do things? Things that you never thought you'd be able to do, but it turns out the deepest, darkest parts of your soul, you can. And you'll be asking yourself, why have you left me, Lord? Why have you forsaken me and left me in the tenth level of hell? And he'll, of course, never answer you. He's an a-hole. And I tell you, the pain festers. Festers inside of you, and it will never go away. And you may think to yourself, you may like the other sex. But you don't. You don't. You just don't. And you'll stand at the edge of that cliff, and you'll ask yourself, what's the point? There is no point, is there? There's only the empty void. And that's what a man and woman do when they love each other very, very much. I hope this has helped you out. It certainly has me. Add that with the consistent soundtrack of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which I swear almost always pairs perfectly with this character's wild rants, and you have one of the best things Doug has ever created, in my personal opinion. I have a big problem. My cat ruins all the furniture around my house. How can I make the bastard pay? Well, there's several different methods to handle this. You can either spray the cat with water, you can rub his face in it and say no, no. Or my personal favorite, crucifixion. Or in this case, catsifixion. 
nail your cat to a cross, keep him stuck up there for several days, and then say, Bad kitty, no ruining my furniture. By that point he'd be dead, but at least we would have learned his lesson, and he'll take it with him to his kitty grave. You know, time and time again, Doug will showcase that he rather likes taking on the role of villain. Even his current channel banner shows him sinisterly smiling at his audience. And I don't say this as a diss at all, I mean, I'm fucking one to talk. But my point here being is I think Doug is much more natural playing this type of character. It's truer to himself, you might say. I have a brother who wears glasses, how do I stop myself from confusing him with you? Well, have you thought about giving your brother a name? Think about that. Give him a name like, uh, Jerry. Once you have named your brother Jerry, ask him, Jerry, are you that guy with the glasses? And he'll say, no, I'm Jerry, remember? And thus the confusion will be over. What a terrible question. He also had a section for his various one-off sketches, with one of them being the one he advertised all over when the site was first going up, called The Most Disturbing Aristocrats Joke Ever, which is basically just that. It goes from this... What is this act you want to talk to me about? I'm glad you asked. Alright, so it starts off with me, my wife, and my two adorable children, Jason and Melissa. We're sitting on stage at a table where we're drinking herbal tea and eating bits of jam and bread. I set my glass down and I look at my youngest child, Melissa, and I ask her if she knew what happened to the car this morning. Melissa looks up to me and says, no, in the most adorable way she can. It's absolutely precious. To eventually this. Going on, I take my daughter, who's most likely dead at this point. That is to say, if slitting her throat doesn't do it, surely the sight of her mother and brother getting ass raped by Dobermans and Richard Attenborough should do the trick. And I stick my hand up her ass. I maneuver it around a little bit, and all of a sudden, we have ourselves a good old-fashioned puppet show. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. After that, I shout out the secret word, hopscotch. That's the cue for the dogs to start shitting like crazy. And it goes! everywhere! On the stage, on the curtain, on the dogs, on the actors, on Richard Attenborough. And so I take the corpse of my dead daughter and I shove her face into it. I take some and I put it on my face too. And suddenly we have ourselves a minstrel show! Hey, Mammy, what'd you do last night? I got shit face! Ha ha ha! I'll leave the context of said jump and the punchline for those who wish to watch it in full, I suppose. But it does kind of remind me of Ask That Guy With The Glasses type of humor. Very dark, sinister, but captivating at the same time. Then we have a video that actually went somewhat viral all on its own, which is titled How I Quit My Job, which sees Doug walk into his workplace, start blurring classical music that eventually turns into Bohemian Rhapsody, and then proudly declares that he quits his job. I show you the whole thing, but the music is for sure going to get copyright claimed. But all the same, this video to me really said something about Doug Walker. That he was ready to put his ass on the line. That with the launch of this new site, he was going to put all of his passion, work hours, and general time into that content. And that meant quitting his current job. And you know, Doug does kind of have a taste for the theatrics. Can't say I don't relate to him a little bit in that regard. But after that video ends with him and his brother running out of the building with them threatening to call the cops despite the fact that he's clearly already leaving the building, Doug then notes this. Alright, let's, let's go. Let's go. Woo! Hey, what have we learned today, boys and girls? Boys and girls, we have learned that that bridge has officially been burned. <laughs> <laughs> I say that's an understatement. <laughs> Doug shows some bravery here. Maybe also a bit of a brash stupidity as well. But honestly, no matter what comes next, I think this video showcased Doug's creative hunger and optimism for the future, which I genuinely really respect. Not all the skits were hits though. In fact, some of them were just downright awful, such as the infamous Melvin Brother of the Joker episode one, Ray Guns, which I kid you not, is one of the most cringe things Doug has ever created. And I think it's only fair to uh, quickly dissect it. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. I'm cool. 
Hello, hi, I am Melvin, the brother of the Joker. I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard of me, but uh, I am the brother of, yes, the infamous Joker. You know, why so serious, you know, all that stuff. Uh, actually, I too have been working on my own catchphrase. Um, sploopity splooch. May not be as catchy, but uh, I, I think it works. So, yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, Doug really, really like the Joker from The Dark Knight, which <laughs> had uh, just recently come out at that point in time. It was in the cultural zeitgeist, and Doug had already made a couple of Joker-type sketches before this. But as the title of episode 1 implies, it would seem that Doug had the idea to create another possible series based around this character, Melvin, brother of the Joker. And, uh, well... Right, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome all the newcomers to my blog. Hello. Uh, hopefully we're going to talk a lot about evil! Lots of nasty evil evil! I repeat myself? I guess it doesn't matter. Um, you know, because evil does repeat itself. It's all about getting that massive... I don't know where I'm going with that. Anyway, okay, so, uh, today's secret subject, or not secret, not, I mean, it's all secret, don't, don't tell anybody, but, you know, today's, uh, big, I should say, big subject is... Ray Guns! Now, the... Now, this is kind of a silly premise. You know, a lesser Joker who's really trying to be taken seriously. Huh, <laughs> get it? But then you hear this. Doubt. So, so what you're gonna wanna do, if you wanna get a ray gun, there, there's uh, all sorts of ray guns that you can get. There's, um, there's a uh, laser, uh, there's a uh, solar, there's a... Uh, there's, uh, chocolate. ones that fire bullets. I, I guess that'd just be a gun. Melvin. There's, uh... Melvin. Little busy right now! Uh, there's Melvin. the ones that, um, shoot raisins. Melvin. I haven't seen that as much. Uh, but Melvin. they do exist. I saw it on eBay. Melvin. I, uh... What?! I'm thirsty. Make me some hot chocolate. No, I'm busy! Busy I'm busy. What? That's my, um... Uh, secretary. She is, uh, very, very Melvin, evil indeed. Why haven't you taken out the garbage yet? Mom, please don't annoy Melvin, me! Keep it down, Melvin. No, I have to do this! Ma I keep it down! I'm trying to watch Columbo Mary's Matlock. I will try to keep it down, Mother. Why? Okay? I didn't hear you. I said I will try to keep no, it down! Oh, you're hurting my ears, Melvin! You're hurting my ears. So anyway. Such a failure. This is only two and a half minutes of nearly a nine minute sketch, by the way. Just, uh, thought I'd point that out. Later, he does a whole joke about souping his mother up on NyQuil and the like to knock her out cold. Proceeds to start making a point about not needing a ray gun, despite just saying a second ago that he has someone working on getting him one. And then he asks what a ray gun can do that a normal gun can't. Which seems like it was going to go into the needlessly overdramatics of supervillains' plans in comics as kind of a, a joke and a bit. But then he just stops the joke before it goes anywhere by saying that, well, maybe he could really use one because I guess it could blow up a whole city or something. Uh, but then he can't afford it because it's just too much money and stopping, going silent, taking a deep breath, and then saying how he's stressed out because he hasn't had a job, and you might think he's gonna go into a rant about how getting a job as a second-rate villain is hard, but then he stops that joke from going anywhere by saying that, oh wait, evil is his job because he is Melvin, brother of the Joker, and then his mother with the extremely annoying voice starts nagging at him again. Are you, uh, seeing a bit of a problem here? It's almost like improv, but if every single time a story was about to naturally happen and push towards a punchline, or a rant or something, just draws back in to the very start again, to his default position. No joke being made besides the vague idea that he is the Joker but incompetent. And this is only half of the video thus far. He then says he doesn't see the necessity for ray guns, but he will get one and someone is building him one. All the points coming back up 
again, and that the guy building him one works at Circus City. So then he goes ahead and calls him. It's ringing. Hey, B, how you doing? Melvin. Melvin Pothorn. The brother of the Joker? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't think you'd forget me. So, um, yeah, how's our, uh, how's our uh, ray gun doing there? Uh-huh. Well, what, uh... I see. Well, does it still shoot lasers like we thought? Oh. Well, how large is it? Two, it, so that's like... The, the, that can fit in my pocket. It's not really a gun, that's more of a toy. Well, well what does it fire? It fires cashews. Well, that, that's not going to be very threatening to the hero, is it? No, it is not. I don't care if the hero is allergic to nuts, that's not going to work. Okay, okay, calm down. Calm down. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me. No, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to yell at you. No, no, no. Really want me to sing it now? I... Alright. There's a place all over the world tonight. We will see each other all throughout the night. Out of sight. Okay, so I can't remember the words, alright? I, I don't care. You know what? You know what? I don't care. I don't care. Uh, I am evil, and I am going to destroy you, with or without your cashew gun. Goodbye. No, goodbye. Yeah, I'll see you Tuesday. Kids! I'm so sorry that you had to see that. Anyway, this skit ends with Melvin saying he's gonna pants the human ant, and he declares that this will be the first of many evilness to come. Uh, my guess is that the next ones are going to be better because uh, I'm going to do a lot more robbing, a lot more uh, uh, stealing of things. And maybe, just maybe, I might pant somebody. Huh? Maybe a uh, certain somebody with pointed ears and wears uh, all black. That's right. The human ant. I'm going to get him. Yeah. Okay, human ant, he's not as big as someone like Batman or Superman, but he is still a very impressive superhero. I mean, I, I don't think it matters that he lives right next door to me. I think that's still very, very impressive. I know a superhero that can obliterate... No, not obliterate, that's what I do. That can save people from me uh, obliterating the world. Yes, yes, that is very impressive. I'm sure that's a lot better than the half the people you know. So... Uh, just to reiterate, uh, ray guns, waste of time, uh, the human ant is my narch, narch nemesis. God, I can't talk today. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, this will be the first of many evilness that will be coming. So, uh, again, this is Melvin, uh, brother of the Joker, signing Melvin. off, and I... Melvin! Mom! Come kiss me goodnight. Yeah, I'm coming, Mom. I'm coming. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. I'm cool. It, uh, it didn't get another episode. Shocker, I know. But it seems even Doug was rather embarrassed by the whole thing and would uh, later go on to reference it, poking fun at himself for making such a terrible, terrible skit. While these come later, I also feel like it's worth noting the short miniseries he would release via the sketches sections called Flashbacks. These were a look back at Doug's oldest stuff, his high school and college films, sketches, and other stuff he did with a camera, which gives us a look back at Doug's earliest creative efforts. The first of these is titled Go West, made according to Doug either very late high school or in very early college years, and was made for a class. The short film features Doug playing a cowboy and also his at-the-time girlfriend as well playing the uh, love interest. This one was recorded via VHS tapes and fittingly has that grimy low-quality look. As for the film itself, uh, well, it's very interesting. Only for the most beautiful eyes this side of the county. Aren't you sweet? And, uh, to whom do I owe the pleasure? I'm Jenny. It means she whose eyes sparkle like diamonds. 
Yeah. <laughs> so they have a fun time frolicking and what have you until Jenny's fiance comes to pick her up, something which Bud is rather taken off guard by. I've had the most wonderful time. I can't believe we met just two minutes ago. <laughs> Oh, Jenny, you're saucier than a Texas prime rib on barbecue night. Jenny! Jenny! Oh, <laughs> I have to go. Who's that? That's my fiancé. Your fiancé? Yeah, did I forget to tell you? Yeah! Are you sure? Yeah! If you really care for me, then find me. Find me where I'm going. Look, look. Where? Where will I find you? Jenny! Find me out west! So she's whisked off by her fiancé and she tells Bud to go find her. That if he really wants her to go west, slipping out of one of her shoes as she's pulled away. And so Bud goes after her. All while the song Go West by the Pet Shop Boys plays in the background, which was apparently the inspiration behind the film to begin with. So Bud then breaks into the two's wedding, looking like he's about to whisk her off her feet and object to this wedding, only for him to then return her shoe that she slipped out of and leave. Which was a uh, pretty decent punchline to the whole thing, especially since it was just a quick student thing. The second of these features is the short film titled Life with Death, which is a documentary about the Grim Reaper, wherein Doug plays the Grim Reaper. This one's again being an early college film, and this one is pretty cut and dry. It features most jokes that one would come up with about the the Grim Reaper in his daily life. I like the thrill of killing, kind of losing his luster. The people always try to run away from him and then he has to chase them. That his job is a hard one. And that sometimes he even takes bribes from people, etc. Cause I can't find the guy! I will say to you, Mr. President! I hate the living. Death's occupation often comes at odds with the living majority, creating some hostility but death takes it all in stride. People think I get some sort of sick thrill out of killing people. And yeah, that pretty much sums it up. But even death is not without his flaws. <sighs> this idea that you can play chess with me and win your life back is false. Totally, totally false. But I do take bribes. Eh. <sighs> <laughs> Sometimes. The third of these is one of the more significant ones, entitled The Room. Yes, I know. And is this time a horror film. This was apparently his final for a video journalism class, which was supposed to be five minutes. He then asked the teacher if he could make it ten minutes, and then the short ended up being fifteen minutes after it was all said and done. The opening features a pretty standard setup for a film like this, with Doug's character looking to buy this house that's being offered for a very cheap price. And it seems almost too good to be true. And then it turns out that there was a terrible tragedy that happened here, that the parents that once lived here before had a son who died of leukemia. Well, he buys the house anyway, of course, and he even makes his main bedroom the bedroom of the kid who died. And as you might expect, he starts then hearing strange noises and general a ghost-like things begin to happen, like moving objects, etc. Notably, there is at least some nice camera angles and shots from time to time, despite the really shitty quality of the footage. I like this part where the lights have gone off and he has to try and get to the garage to turn them back on, only for the sounds of footsteps behind him to get him to start panicking, finally getting the light back on, only to turn around and see that this garage string thing is then swinging back and forth.
It's ironically a cool little scene. Later, it becomes pretty obvious that the ghost of that little kid who died seems to be haunting this place, and Doug's character grows ever more scared and unsure of what to do. After a night of frights, he ends up going back to his room, and writing a note for the ghost to stop scaring him and to go the hell away. Well, after a while, I suppose he begins to feel bad about him shooing him off. Since it was a little kid ghost, and he was taking up his room, I suppose. And he even completely went away for that matter. So then he decides to move into a different room and let the ghost have that one. To which the ghost then thanks him via a note, ending rather sweetly. Then finally we have the very first film Doug ever made, entitled Modern Art, made when he was a junior in high school, and as Doug describes it, he says that this was made during his pretentious, troubled rebel phase. The short film has Doug sporting a bit of an emo type look, almost Tim Burton-ish, I might say, as he smiles at the camera in this sinister fashion, with this whimsical yet gothic Danny Elfman sounding track in the background. The main premise of this film is Doug creating these pieces of modern art, getting inspiration from all sorts of things like horror films, the Joker, and various bits of dark imagery. However, he keeps making piece after piece only to find that he's not satisfied with them. He also has this bit where he's posing in front of a mirror in order to get the right facial expressions for the next piece all to the sound of Rob Zombie's Dragula playing in the background. Then he gets inspiration from the Holy, going to a church and admiring the statues and art, looking through the Bible, etc. But he's still not satisfied. Then he looks back to his book and read about modern art. Finally, and then he shows his art to a museum guy or something, I guess, and all these pieces of art, which the museum guy only seems to think are just okay. But then he finally showcases his final piece of modern art, a black dot on a white canvas, to which he then gets paid. I suppose the message here being that modern art, what sells is simplistic shapes without imagination, no heart or soul. Now Doug, at the start of each of these films, has a small intro where he basically describes the movie and when it was made, and how bad and silly they are. This one seemingly being the one he's the most embarrassed by. But to tell you the truth, I actually like this one the most of these four films. Sure, it's a bit cringe in places, but it's also got a lot of heart. And when I see that evil smirk grow across that teenage Doug's face, I see the start of something. The vision of the man he would become. Hell, even the message about art here is something he would end up repeating in later years. And whether Doug likes to say this is a phase or not, I still very much see this guy in the works of this guy to this very day. All that being said, this isn't even the only characters, shows, and skits Doug would end up trying out and making into series for this website. And regardless if I think one of them is a massive hit and the other is kind of a big miss, what objectively is true, all the same, is that Doug was trying anything he could, pumping out content of various types and really putting his all into it. Not unlike another creator I covered at around this same point in time, which, speaking of... So those of you who have been watching my channel a fair bit have heard me discuss this piece of internet history at least one or two times at this point. But if you'll allow me to discuss it just one more time, from the perspective of Doug Walker, I think you'll find that this part of the critic's history is just far too important to not discuss. So this whole thing started pretty damn close to when thatguyoftheglasses.com first launched, April 18th of 2008 to be specific. In a video titled The Nerd Rant, in which the critic addresses people who have often compared him to the angry video game nerd. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And I have a bone to pick with one angry video game nerd. At least once a week, one of your fans comments on my video saying that I am very similar to you. Oh yeah, an angry critic who's obsessed with the past? Never seen one of those before. 
But the fact of the matter is, these comparisons keep coming and coming and coming. As both you and I know, there is no comparison. I am by far the greater talent. I mean, you may have reviewed bad video games, but I reviewed bad movies based on bad video games, which is far worse. You may have reviewed the third Ninja Turtles movie, but I had the courage to review all three in a row. P.S. Horbafuckus is still copyrighted. And you may have beaten the shit out of Bugs Bunny, but that's nothing. Here's a taste of what I do to myself. <laughs> <laughs> And if that's what I can do to me, just imagine what I can do to you. So, I say to you, angry video game nerd, if that is your real name, keep your fans under control. You don't see my fans leaving threatening comments all over your videos, like they should be. So, please, leave this petty, jealous rage behind you and simply acknowledge that I'm the better man. If you accept this defeat, please respond by leaving absolutely no comment whatsoever. In fact, don't even respond to this video. In fact, act like you have a million other things going on in your life that you wouldn't even have time to watch this video, let alone respond to it. Do that, and I will accept your apology. But, if there are any more outbursts out of you, Mr. Video Game Nerd, I swear to God, there will be words. Followed by some more words. Followed by maybe a few more words. And then topped off with an ass whooping! I'm talking nerd on critic action, and I assure you it will not be pretty. It will be very unpretty. A bull. I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it, so you don't have to. Now, I've always found this rant and the following skits to come to be some strokes of internet genius. I mean, at this point, believe it or not, there was already a ton of fans and people online comparing other internet personas to one another and drama was already very much afoot. Doug could have just ignored the comparisons. He could have also taken it seriously like so many dumbasses did back then, but Doug instead used this common comparison to make more content. After all, I'm sure no one would have expected at the time that the critic would actually throw shit at the nerd and his fanbase. And while it's obviously done in good fun, word spread rather quickly over on the ScrewAttack forums, where fans alerted James Rolfe about this critic callout video, to which Doug then would make a video and skit to respond to James rather nice compliments about his work. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And perhaps some of you remember the last video I posted posted where I threatened the angry video game nerd to stop his fans from making unfair comparisons to me. Well, I got news for you, faithful viewers. The angry video game nerd has responded on his forum, which still counts! He responded under the forum topic, Nostalgia Critic calls out angry video game nerd. You got some balls, buddy. You just couldn't leave it alone, could you? You just had to leave a comment about my video, didn't you? Well, you want to keep this going? I'm game if you're game. So, let's see what threatening words the angry video game nerd has to throw at me. The forum comment reads, and I quote, I've seen some of his videos. His Cloverfield review was hilarious. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he did the five second movies also. Those put me to tears. So yes, call me a f fan of his. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? That's not a threat, that's a, a, what's that word I never give anybody? Um, a compliment. You Give me a compliment! You're the angry video game nerd, not the emotionally aware video game nerd! I see what you're trying to do. Yeah, you're trying to one-up me, aren't you? You're trying to look like the big, better man when deep down inside you hate me just as much as I hate you. Well, I know how you think. If I'm not mistaken, there is a hidden message inside of this comment. A message that's secretly sending me a dirty insult. And I intend to find it out. Right now! Once again, I love the writing here. The critic as a character, I feel, was strongly defined as a character here. With some of those notes of being vindictive, petty, immature, really shining through. And after this long skit of the critic trying to find the secret message behind the nerd's nice words, we then get this wonderful payoff. Investigating, I think I finally figured out the secret of the message. And so, the angry video game nerd's message translates out to... Tis ein Ketzil sit Turk I Glassen. Which isn't German, isn't Latin, and isn't Gaelic. 
Which means it's... COMPLETE AND TOTAL GIBBERISH! I just wasted hours and hours of research to come up with absolutely nothing! True, I discovered an untraceable pattern in the stock market that would lead to nothing but higher returns, but that's inconsequential! I've wasted my life dedicated everything to complete bullshit! I mean, look at me! Look at me! I look like a roadmap for dizzy people! <sighs> I guess he really had nothing bad to say at all. And here I wore my thinking wig for nothing. <sighs> I guess the angry video game nerd really is the better man. I guess it's best just to acknowledge that in a world of vengeance, anger, and chaos, there are those who can always find the peaceful route. And in the end, maybe that's the essence of all mankind. <gasps> A very short time would pass between this, with the Pokemon Nostalgia Critic video fitting snugly in the middle, before Doug would then create yet another callout video to the nerd, which at this point, I just want to say, has been a completely one-sided fight, with Doug, or maybe I should say the critic throwing shade, insults, etc. towards the nerd. Like that guy with the glasses .com. To advertise it, I created a trailer filled with zooming text, bright flashes, and some fast speed editing. Not a few days later, I posted a detailed list of what movies I was going to review next. First a short tribute to Animaniacs, and then The Wizard, a 1980s film that was sponsored by Nintendo. Right now I'm about halfway through editing and so far, no complaints. But then, less than 24 hours later, take a look at what the angry video game nerd posted on his site. Gee, it's a trailer filled with zooming text, bright flashes, and some fast speed editing. Oh, and it also turns out that the guy who reviews nothing but video games is also reviewing a movie. Which movie, you may ask? Well, how about the fucking wizard? You dirty, stuck-up, sadistic, shit. Asshole! You just couldn't let me get to it first, could you? You just had to steal my thunder. So it seems that the angry video game nerd has officially become the irate gamer to my incredible genius. Okay, okay, alright. That was too far. But still, the evidence stands. I absolutely love the comment about the irate gamer, which, uh, don't think I forgot about him. There's an episode of Internet Fables coming for him eventually, just you wait. But news to say, Doug was very much in the know, keeping up with what others were saying about the nerd, the nerd ripoffs, and general drama, and knew just what to say to both keep the faux drama going, while also giving people exactly what they wanted. Well, eventually this leads up to James, or the nerd, actually finally responding to the critic via a video. Mind you, James is much, much more clear about his insults towards a guy being meant as a joke, in case anyone was dumb enough to think that it was an actual feud. I'd normally say that this wasn't needed, but then I remember how some AVGN fans can be, and suddenly I understand why he made it so perfectly clear. But anyway, pretty quickly after, Doug would use parts of that same video to react with, with his own response. And I have been attacked, Pearl Harbored if you will, by a swarm brought on by the angry video game nerd. Last week, the angry video game nerd posted this video response. I'm the fucking nerd, and there's this guy called the Nostalgia Critic, and he's been talking about me an awful lot lately. So here's my big comeback to you, Nostalgia Critic. You suck. Bastard! Yeah, I got pens, and I'm not afraid to use them. Your mighty pens don't scare me, boy. Now you might be thinking, uh, is that his comeback? Is that all he's got? Of course! Your primitive brain can't conjure up much more. Well, no. I got more. You're a poopy head. <laughs> Curse those pens. I really like how you deciphered my hidden meaning. Well, you were close. It was actually, lick my balls, you piece of shit nostalgia critic. Yes, yes, forgot to carry the one. I am the domination of the internet. <laughs> you diabolical cream puff. Not only have you insulted my honor, but you also left an advertisement for my site at the end of your video. Knowing damn well that so many people would flood to my site that would overwhelm my video bandwidth, thus I would have to shut down the site for a couple days. You are indeed a most worthy adversary. 
Well, put your money where your mouth is, nerd. You think this job is easy? You think it's just a walk in the park to review these horrible nostalgic movies? It's not. And I'm going to prove it to you. I challenge you, angry video game nerd, to review the worst nostalgic movie that you can find. I'll even let you make the choice. Or maybe one of your fans can make a recommendation. Whatever you choose, you have to review this piece of horror nostalgic shit on your show. What's the matter, nerd? Too chicken? Too yellow to take on the challenge? Ha! I eat pieces of yellow for breakfast, and chicken is my favorite color. You know what I mean? I give you two days, nerd. Two days to respond to my challenge. Two days, or whenever is most convenient. I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it, so you don't have to. To war, nerd. To war! Now, from here on June 28th, the angry video game nerd and Captain S, James Rolfe and Brett Vanderbrook, respectively, were attending a digital press event in Clifton, New Jersey. It was a ScrewAttack.com thing. Well, Doug decided that this would be the perfect time for a video to be made, for them both to meet face to face, to really up the ante on this rivalry they had. Now, funnily enough, in my interview with Brett Vanderbrook, he actually talked about the fact that this was all planned very last minute, and James was even a bit apologetic towards Brett, since this was supposed to be their thing, and clearly the critic coming in would change that. But Brett, being the chat he is, didn't mind that at all. I bring this up because some might be under the impression that this grand battle, this a bitter rivalry, was something that was semi-planned out when in reality, it was mostly just opportunities and jokes being hurled when the chance was given. On Doug's side, a travel log would be made of both him and Rob driving to the event, which was a funny little showcase of both him and his brother's chemistry, and several kinds of funny skits are done throughout the drive. Then we get this conversation between Doug and James and Mike Matei, and the like about what they plan on doing and saying at the event. If you decided to do, this will save us time, this will save you having to do in our video, challenging me to do a video game review. It's just me saying, like, you know, have you decided to do a nostalgic movie? And mm. you say, yes, I'm going to do whatever you choose. Mm. And then you say, now are you going to do a video game? I'm like, no, I'm not doing a video game. It's your department. I was thinking, do you have the Rocky soundtrack? I'm sure you do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, let's do it. All right, bring it on. Yeah. And they play the Rocky music, like, we get ready to fight. Yeah. And we go, we just had this silly slow-mo fight. You know, like, we even do the sound effects. Yeah. You know, you beat me, and at the end I say, all right, all right, I'll do a video game. But mark my words, this isn't over, ha ha, and then ask, like, how to get back on the highway or something like that. Like, <laughs> it's oh. going to be like that playing Rocky Five with people like oh standing, my God, that's standing around. Oh, it'll be outside. Oh, it'll be like, yeah. no, it's oh, like you should, you should say that. It's definitely say my ring's outside. <laughs> Let's do it right now, right here. Yeah. My ring's outside. But you know what? My ring's outside. Let's do it! Yeah! There's only one thing, it's kind of a side thing, but I just think we should really put it in there. He was just... The, the idea we'll get Captain S in on this too, and I don't know exactly what he would be doing, but the he could be the referee. Be, yeah, he would, I would imagine he would be more like trying to be the peacemaker. And but we punch then him. you end up fight. Yeah, then it would be the three of us all fighting there in the parking lot of the digital <laughs> press. All right, nice to meet you. Like, yeah, thanks thanks a lot, nice. Yeah, thanks a lot. You're done. Ah! You're done. You're familiar with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, parts of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, we all. Uh, I'll, I'll put the scene on. Basically, your idea would just be to mimic that. I can do, I can walk, see, you see how it's got the multiple shots? Yeah. I can literally walk in between you guys, because you can re-edit this however you want. Yeah. I can just train the camera on your eyes, you know, on your faces. You can give me the looks, and I can walk to the next person. The whole time you three are still basically standing yeah. in the triangle. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny looking back at this, knowing how shy James usually is, and how he's very much the same here with Mike doing a lot of the talking for him at some point, and that seems to be what finally gets him to start being more comfortable after a while. Seems like in the end they all had a lot of fun though. The results of this, video narrative wise, is a confrontation between the two internet characters as seen here. How dare you come here? Uh, <laughs> Critic! 
Have you accepted my challenge to review a horrible nostalgic movie? Yes, nostalgic critic, I do accept your challenge. Uh, but you must suffer at a bad game. E.T. Hold on, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, a bad game. The threat department. I thought this week was all online. I didn't think this was for real. You stay out of this. You had like ten disclaimers on your video. You know, just because we saved Christmas together doesn't mean you have to be involved in this. You can just, oh, this has get out of this. Cool. This isn't cool. your business. Who are you? Sorry, are you a YouTuber or something? And the I was. I was almost as popular as him. I was like number fifty. <laughs> <laughs> You know what, nerd? Let's sell this right now, right here, right now. In the ring, in the ring. But you know what? My ring's outside. Let's do it. This leads to the three of them heading outside and doing this good, the bad, and ugly routine before slow mo fighting and generally just kind of goofing around. The whole exchange ends with the nerd being dared to review a bad movie and the critic being dared to review a bad game. And Captain S, well, he doesn't do anything. Actually, on that note, because I know not as many people will have seen my interview with Brett, I actually did a whole episode of Internet Fables about the series of Captain S, and Brett would later reach out for an interview, which was a lot of fun to do. Brett, and by extension Captain S, is often referred to as the third wheel in this exchange, which is true but many took this opportunity to shit all over Captain S and by extension Brett, since they didn't see him as being worthy to fight with the nerd and the critic. Which is just dumb since this is all internet tomfoolery anyway. And at this point in time, while these two both had their dedicated and very much growing fan bases, they were nowhere near the giants that they would become, though the seeds of their influence was already very much being planted. Plus, again, this was supposed to be a James and Brett thing, and the critic was technically the third wheel coming in, but, you know, that's not how history remembers it, I suppose. On that note, I've also seen some people say that Doug kind of strong-armed his way into getting extra popular by fighting with a more popular, hell, the most popular at the time, angry men on the internet. This is half true. I mean, this whole exchange and what comes after fed both fandoms into one another. I distinctly remember back in the day that I first learned about the Nostalgia Critic due to all the fan art and people bringing him up as the nerd's bitter rival. People really got into this and were having a ton of fun with it. I know for a fact that ThatGuyOfTheGlasses.com got its first major surge of new viewers from this artificial conflict, and James seemed more than happy to help Doug out in that regard. While some have cynically said that this was all nothing but business, I, on the other hand, say credulously that this was both business and fun. After all, it's clear that they both benefited from this whole thing, put their characters on display, it excited the fans of both sides, and it was incredibly ahead of its time, as far as a, a creative collaboration goes. And it also seemed like they both had a lot of fun. It was a win-win for everyone, I suppose is what I'm saying. On that note, after they both would end up holding through their word with the nerd reviewing the Rocky movie knockoff Ricky, which was an okay review, pretty chill but nothing all that memorable, the Nostalgia Critics review, on the other hand, of a video game went above and beyond. Doug knew all eyes were on him, and by God did he deliver, featuring the remix of the classic AVGN song, with some great gags like him drinking Rolling Rock and spewing it out immediately. He's gonna take you back to the past To pull these reviews out of his ass He'd rather have a crocodile Pin him down and suck on his cock He'd rather eat some rotten dog shit Than drown it down with Rolling Rock Him imitating the great camera work of James' videos, albeit not as good, but still, which I'll note was a pretty big deal for Doug at this point in time. Since every other internet video that we have seen from him, for the most part, 
has just been a still frame of him sitting or standing somewhere. So this was much more effort than we had seen from him in previous videos, camera-wise up to that point. Then you add the critic's pretty damn good commentary, over-the-top reactions of his own flavor of screaming. A time limit? There's a time limit? I can eat my way through a WALL faster than I can defeat these assholes, and there's a TIME LIMIT! And you have what I like to call some pretty Kino content for the time. Blue. Blue. <gasps> it's changing! It's changing! There it goes! It's getting darker! Oh my god, it's almost red! I knew it! I knew I could do it! I knew I could pull it off! to get rid of me angry video game nerd you are much mistaken sure i will need years of psychological therapy to recover from this but that doesn't mean you've heard the last of me all i can say angry video game nerd is fuck this game and fuck you for making me play it Easy angry video game oh shut up now from here another video would be made where the nerd and the critics seem to be putting aside their differences that they now understand each other's pain and the type of bullshit each have to go through. But then the nerd takes a pot shot at the critic and, well... Yeah, I mean seriously, why are we doing this? I don't know. It's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't matter. I mean, just the fact that I'm the better talent, I mean, nobody really cares. It's not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, I guess you have a point there. You know, it makes me realize that, um... What? Ah, <laughs> yeah, but don't worry. I mean, it's not like you have to stop making your inferior videos. Suck my big fat snozzage, you festering ton of ass! Yeah, fuck you, you fucking cocksucker, fuck, 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 fart! Alright, let's settle this. Let's settle this once and for all. A giant epic battle of nerd on critic action violence to the death! Oh, okay. You want your nerd on critic action? Well then, show me that you have the balls, get your ass over here, and we'll have the final battle. Alright, nerd, let's settle this. Let's settle this forever! Get your ass over here! Fine! And so the final battle commences. Well, over on the nurse channel, that's how it went down, since all he had to do was wait for the critic to get his ass over there. Meanwhile, on the critic's side, there would be several more videos that would come out in between this confrontation, but each review during this time would open with this pre-recorded review message since the critic in real time was currently still running to the nerd's house which was a fun little gimmick while it lasted i distinctly remember getting super hyped back in the day for this battle as silly as it sounds these were two of the coolest mofos i knew online at the time two guys that at this point were not only entertaining me on the daily but were also starting to deeply inspire me and them facing off was the cherry on top of it all and while i might have been a young teen at that point i know i wasn't the only one that felt this way either back then also this is some lore that i'm sure almost nobody remembers but during this time they also made a fucking card game about the nerd and critic fight as seen here. About geek fight, angry video game nerd versus nostalgia critic. As you can see, these are some pretty kick-ass cards with some pretty kick-ass artwork. A lot of artists worked hard on these drawings and you can see their effort really shows. There's also a lot of creativity put into them too. I mean look at this, you got the evil Teddy Ruxpin, Chester A. Bum, even as that guy somehow made it into the deck. Including his weird ass creation of hamster jelly. I don't know how the hell they drew that. But they did, and it's pretty damn cool. The only real problem I have is the angry video game nerd cards. I mean, look at him. He almost looks respectable. What a completely flawed misrepresentation. But the critic cards are great, making me look strong, masculine, and incredibly well endowed. Did I say that out loud? Well, anyway, you can buy them for $7 plus shipping. That's a pretty damn good deal. Purchases can be made at divingdragongames.com shop. Tell me, anyone in the comment section, did any of you guys buy this card set? 
Anybody? What? Was it fun? Was it cool? D do you still have it? In the end, the actual fight is a lot of fun, with several gags and both the nerd and the critic callbacks. Though there is for sure more on the nerd side since it was his house. Then they have a Street Fighter fight. A lightsaber duel. And an all-out special effects fight with the critic using the power of the devil to gain the upper hand of the nerd. Before the nerd then gets the help of Super Mecha Death Christ to finally destroy the critic. The nerd having won the day. It's silly obviously, but it was exactly what I wanted and expected back in the day. And to this day, still holds up as an immensely fun and creative collaboration between two great content creators, hungry to make as much content as they could. But this actually would not be the end of this collaboration between the two. I mean, obviously they would continue to work with each other otherwise, but there are actually two extra pieces of this angry computer man drama that I have yet to cover in any of my other Internet Fables episodes thus far. But we'll get to those two in just a short bit. There was also a behind the scenes video made about James, Doug, Mike, and Rob coming up with the ideas and general skits for this grand finale as well. Including this super amusing part where Doug reveals that he doesn't know how to tie a tie. A signature part of his outfit. And the one he took with him has come undone. And no one else in the house of four guys knows how to tie a tie. It's a historic moment. Getting dressed in the house of the enemy. Very surreal. Oh shit. There we go. Nope, I just ruined this whole thing. <laughs> this might be trouble. Because <laughs> I actually don't know how to tie a tie. So I just do it once and I just keep it up and now it's falling apart. Do you want me to turn the camera off now? Because <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing. This is very embarrassing. Let me see if they know how to tie it. Do you know how to tie a tie? You know what, I don't. Do you know how to tie a tie? Oh, you know what, um... Kind of, not really. <laughs> There's four guys in this house! Yeah. Nobody knows how to tie a tie! Well, you don't, so... <laughs> I, I know! <laughs> now he's dressing you. <laughs> <laughs> Thieves. This is never making it anywhere. This is never gonna be sure. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna make sure this gets in there. You know what? I don't have a clue. <laughs> this whole epic battle. You know what? All to a halt because of a fucking tie. Wait. What? Oh no. Wait, oh. oh. Uh. No. Don't touch me! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Doug, do you want to explain what happened? Uh, I'm a douche, and I, uh, can't tie a tie, and, and this place with, like, four guys, none of us know how to tie a tie, so we had to get James's wife to do it. And did she do a good job? Uh, she did a pretty decent, this is about the closest we're gonna get. Fucking priceless. But at any rate, I think it's time we get back to the main content proper, and start to really dissect the first year of the Nostalgia Critics series, so that you don't have to. So, unlike what I do with the AVGN retrospective, I'm not going to go over everything Doug did over the uh, first year and a half or so, or first season slash season two, whatever you want to call it. What I am going to cover are select episodes, general themes, and structure of his videos, and how they evolved. Judge all of his top 11 lists made during this time, and overall cover what I find the most interesting from the series, from the start of when he first started uploading to his new website, all the way up to the first year anniversary that I've yet to cover thus far. Starting with The Wizard Review. Now, when going through these, I'm not going to do a play-by-play -play since, well, the majority of Nostalgia Critic videos from this time frame and, I mean, really, the entire time frame he's been making these reviews, I guess, is him doing a play-by-play -play of the events of the film, 
with commentary sprinkled throughout. So for the sake of not causing a play-by-play -play inception of sorts, I'm gonna try to avoid doing that. However, some of the larger criticisms in his style is more what I'm looking at here. And one interesting note I found almost immediately watching through these early episodes of Nostalgia Critic is that a lot of the jokes tended to have a bit more of a bite to them. Some edge, some might say, with him often looking at innocent interactions like a father and son bonding over video games in this film and turning into a skit on incest. There, Nick hooks up a Nintendo system, which seems to bring this father and son closer together. Do do? Doesn't take much intelligence to play that game, does it? You should know. Really close together. Wanna go grab a bite to eat? Nintendo. It makes you gay! Now you're playing with incest. Or how about this one joke he made in the Kazam review? Alright, so we meet a boy named Max who apparently likes to walk around school and make faces at this mentally retarded kid. Ah, uh, but it was a different time, don't you know? Or how about the time he made fun of a voice actor who died tragically due to lung cancer in the TMNT 2007 film review? Yeah, I think I'll let it play out real quick. <laughs> Raphael! Excuse me, I just walked in from Kung Fu Panda. Donatello, this home has become like an empty shell. Each of your brothers has Oh god, what did they do to this player's voice? It sounds like Mr. Miyagi if he smoked a million Marlboros. If you don't learn to recognize this... Pitiful. Just to be clear, that was the voice of Mako, who also voiced uh, Aku and several other very popular, famous characters in animated works and the like, who passed away, unfortunately, to esophageal cancer, who Doug just made fun of for sounding like he uh, smokes a bunch of cigarettes. Now, to be fair to Doug, he was clearly not aware of this fact, uh, because people made sure he was aware of that fact, and in the very next review he did of Red Sonja, he actually addressed this uh, criticism that he got pretty quickly after people got pretty upset at him uh, making fun of a beloved voice actor. Hello, I'm a Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Before I start this review, let me tell you a little story about a guy named Mako and why you don't want to mess with him. Mako apparently was a very popular sort of underground voice celebrity. He did voices for Avatar The Last Airbender, which I never heard of, Samurai Jack, which I never saw, and played Akira the Wizard in Conan, which I barely remember. So as you can tell, I barely know who this guy is, but apparently a lot of you do, and we're not very happy when I made fun of his voice in the TMNT movie. His home has become like an empty shell. Each of your brothers has Oh god, what did they do to this player's voice? It sounds like Mr. Miyagi if he smoked a million Marlboros. <laughs> Marlboros. Well, apparently a lot of you took this the wrong way thinking that I was making fun of the actor himself, sending me emails like, You don't mess with Mako, motherfucker. Leave Mako alone, he is the man. And you should crucify your privates for making fun of Mako. Well, there goes a one year anniversary, surprise. The fact is, I don't hate Mako, I don't know Mako, I know nothing about Mako. I just thought the voice was a little different compared to the other splinters I've heard before. I mean, sheesh, you act like the guy died or something. God damn it! Okay, okay, so just to recap, I don't hate Mako, I don't know Mako, so logically I can't hate someone I don't know. Especially when he's dead, that makes it very difficult. Now, I of course don't really care about a bit of edgy humor. I'm a bit of an enjoyer of it once in a while myself, don't you know? But remember this controversy because it's going to become a bit of a running theme later on. He also really loves to ham it up and overreact to certain elements in a film, such as the character of Lucas in this one. And uh, where might we find this Lucas? Within the twilight of the full moon. When the sky is dark, but the fire of the stars pierces through the night! That is where you will find... Lucas. <laughs> Dirty Harry, Scarface, the Terminator. Lucas. Fun fact, did you know that the kid who plays Lucas here is a registered sex offender for molesting a child? Well, uh, I suppose that's not so much a fun fact and more so a sad fact, but uh... 
Anyway, that being said, the overacting and overreacting to things in the movies can be quite humorous, and I think are what makes up some of the most iconic and interesting clips from the Nostalgia Critic show. Man has some fucking mad manic energy. Or anything. Problem is, Jen only exists in fairy tales, and I don't believe in fairy tales. Wait, what? Jen only exists in fairy tales, and I don't believe in fairy tales. The genie doesn't believe in fairy tales. The genie doesn't believe in fairy tales. Hello! I'm out! What the hell is up with that glass of water thing? Wait, he was in a glass of water? He suddenly, boom, he's on the table. I mean, what, why did that happen? Is it like Super Mario Brothers? Is it a warp song? I mean, what the? You know what? Forget it. Fine. Let's just move on. The movie will be over faster that way. Out of my hairy ass! Until your fucking little mind can't take it anymore! These are the gayest villains ever! Ah! Explain! Speaking of overreacting, the next review, Batman and Robin, is rather famous. It features the critic reviewing said movie, but from the start, there is an ongoing skit that this movie is apparently so bad that it makes you want to exit the game of life in Dark Souls. Thus, why he doesn't have his tie on and what have you. Now, what is also of note in this movie is it's, well, it's campy and it's supposed to be a bit of a love letter to the old uh, 60s Batman TV show, which doesn't excuse it from shoving in about a hundred ice-related puns, but the critic is also aware of this fact, but seems to very much be in distress about it. So, let's take a look and see just how bad Batman Robin really is. This doesn't seem too bad. They're just suiting up, there's the Batmobile, the music's nice. Maybe this won't be so horrible after all. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. That's right, this Batman movie has stopped moving forward with its dark storyline and complex character development and has instead gone back to the campy, bright, and colorful style of the original Adam West TV show. HELP! Now I'm not about to fucking defend Batman and Robin. But I do find it funny that most people, once they are aware of this fact, will probably go into this movie, probably not going into it expecting the darker tone of the Tim Burton films. Whether they like the movie or not. But the core idea behind the critic is pushing reactions to the extreme. Thus, this rather dumb decision to change the tone and feel of a sequel that might make most wonder why the hell they did that. For the critic, he's about to literally drown himself in Sonic Adventure over it. Batman and Robin chase Freeze into another building, where Robin gets frozen by the ray gun. Stay cool, bad boy. God, how much longer is this movie? Ten minutes? We're only ten minutes in? Oh, this film is gonna be the end of me. This overacting leads into one of the first major memes that came from the series. One of the reactions that became so popular that it made this film forever connected with Doug Walker. And to this day has people saying, Hey, isn't that the film with the blank in it? The blank here, of course, being the Bat credit card. One million dollars. Two million. Three million. Four million. Seven million. <laughs> Never leave the cave without it. A Bat credit card? They gave him a bat credit card? They had the balls to give one of the greatest superheroes of all time a bat credit card? No! No! Does not compute! Does not compute! Does not compute! I think so! I apologize for that outrage. It was childish and immature. I just get... A little peeved when I see one of my childhood icons carrying a bad credit card, you bastards! I'll kill you! I'll kill all of you! Anyway, the critic then gets angry at this line in the film. Sheesh, all that's missing is for Freeze to shout out first Gotham, then the world. First Gotham, and then the world!
and does this whole skit with a little dummy critic doll that is oddly kind of terrifying looking uh, trying to escape this place that he's being forced to review the film in I guess before being beaten up and put back in place off screen then later he gets super mad that a bad guy in the movie says curses because of how cliche that is and goes absolutely batshit crazy go ahead say it I dare you I double dare you motherfucker you know you want to you know you want to do every cliche in the book go ahead say it say it say it curses John damn this movie! It did it! It finally did it! Batman has driven me batshit crazy! Oh. <sighs> Tranquilizers. Always come prepare when Joel Schumacher's involved. Then Doug goes on to sing a song about how crappy the movie is by the end. It is, I'll tell you. It's super crap a fuck horrific. It's be all a bullshit. A film so bad the censors really ought to go and pull it. Sadly, there's not many words that only rhyme with bullshit. Super crap a fuck horrific. It's be all a bullshit. It's perhaps easy to see why this one got shared around a lot. In later reviews, like that of his Captain Planet review or his Surf Ninjas review, some of the guys involved with that guy at the glasses.com's creation would also begin to show up on occasion. Argo. Rob! Mike! What happened to me? You got shot in the head pretty good there, Nostalgia Critic. But how? How did it happen? Well, that was me. I shot you in the head. Sorry. Company chief executive producer, and I know I'm going to mess this name up, so sorry in advance, a Bargov Dronam Raju would end up appearing in the Captain Planet review, playing the character from the show, Mati. Mostly as a kind of joke about how his power is super dumb and that doesn't really fit in with the others in the show. A heart? Are you kidding me? What a fucking coup! I mean, you can't do anything with heart while you make people feel better? Who gives a shit? I mean, this kid totally got ripped off! I mean, how do you think he feels about this whole thing? I recently sat down with Mati this past week to find out just how he felt about this situation. I'll tell you how I feel about the whole situation. I'm fucking pissed off, man. You know? Uh, what kind of kid wants to have heart as a power? I mean, I can't believe it. Jesus! Yeah, but surely there must have been some good that came out of this. After all, you were bringing people together. Fuck people! Bringing people together doesn't help you sell toys. It just makes you a pussy. A pussy! I am a pussy! Well, why do you think you got heart and everyone else got the flashier powers? Because I'm Indian. It's all Ted Turner's plan to keep the Indian man down. Fucking cocksucker! Wait a minute. I thought you were from South America. What's this crap about you being Indian? Um. You're not the real Mati, are you? Um. The thing about that is, uh. Heart! Oh! I am nothing but trouble. Now, what if I told you this character, this one-off joke skit thing, would be a reoccurring joke used in several Nostalgia Critic episodes and specials to come for years to come? This guy playing this same exact character because, uh, uh, well, well it does. Why? I, I don't know. It was not particularly funny the first time and will never ever be funny in the future again. But I guess Doug and the others must have thought it was fucking hilarious. On that note though, I did remember at least enjoying the rest of this episode back in the day. And mainly because he talks about the episode of Captain Planet where a teenager gets AIDS. Which was one of the only episodes I had ever actually seen back in the day uh, when it came on the Boomerang channel. And I remember being so shocked there was a cartoon episode about such a topic. That being said, I also remember when I first went onto the ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com website, uh, back in the day, uh, the newest Nostalgia Critic episode out at that time was the A uh, Tom and Jerry movie review. I remember seeing a lot of those made for TV uh, Tom and Jerry movies back in the day. So it was pretty shocking to find out that there was one that came out in theaters and had the two of them talk no less. Spit watermelon at your own camera shocking? You said it. <laughs> Holy crap! They talk! They actually talked! 
Maybe not, but this video firmly established to me even then that this show would be showing me stuff that I had never heard of, perhaps even with franchises I was pretty familiar with. Which, regardless of if any jokes land or not, is still worth watching since you're gonna learn about new stuff. Going a little journey. Which, again, was how I very much felt about AVGM back in the day as well. The major difference I'm seeing thus far in watching every single episode of Nostalgia Critic again is, well, when I went back to go watch old Angry Video Game Nerd episodes, there were still plenty of jokes, skits, and commentary that really land and are genuinely funny to me to this day. Whereas here, up until this point, I just haven't found the Nostalgia Critic episodes as funny. I've had a chuckle here or there, mostly because sometimes he says stuff that I just genuinely don't remember or didn't expect him to say. But many episodes have been rather difficult to get through depending on the movie he's reviewing especially since I now know about most of the movies he's reviewing. That discovery factor is no longer there for me, which wouldn't matter if the commentary was at least a bit more interesting, more consistently. When I went back to watch old AVGN episodes, I was pulled in by the comfy atmosphere of his room, the fun and creative cinematography, and seeing the nerd interact with characters from time to time. While the Nostalgia Critic is mostly just a still shot of him in front of a yellow wall, which isn't inherently bad, mind you. It just makes episodes visually similar, and when you're marathoning them, can kind of make it all feel like an ongoing episode of a man screaming at stuff. It kind of makes you start to really feel like you're Doug Walker, you know? Like the critic. At any rate, this movie is a musical, and most of the jokes in this review is about how annoyed he is that the movie is a musical. However, the next episode, Teddy Ruxpin Halloween Special, is in my opinion one of the funnier videos that he's done and was a personal favorite of mine back in the day. This one being a bit of a change from form, instead of reviewing an old movie or TV series, here he's reviewing an old toy, that of Teddy Ruxpin, a doll that comes to life when you put a cassette in him, something which the critic finds to be quite scary. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And you wanna know what I remember? This hideous thing! Teddy Ruxpin, one of the creepiest toys that ever hit the market. Aside from being dull, annoying, and hideously ugly, Teddy Ruxpin is just downright scary. He's a mechanical doll that actually comes to life when you put a cassette in him. Watch! It's like one step away from getting a robot to just totally look after your kids. It's stupid, it's creepy, and it deserves to be shelved. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, and I remember it so you don't have to. And that is the end of the actual review. And what follows is the critic then going to bed, and the doll coming back to life, seemingly insulted at the review he gave him. I'm Teddy Ruxpin, and I really, really like you. Yeah, well, I don't like you, you little Berenstain bastard. I'm Teddy Ruxpin, and I want to do horrible things to you. That's an odd thing to say. I'm Teddy Ruxpin, and I want to kill you. Okay, I think I'm just going to take that little demented tape out of you right now, and... I'm Teddy Ruxpin, and I didn't care very much for that review you did. Nostalgia Critic. This is a very AVGN-like scenario, except here we have a chance to see how the critic responds to these types of situations. And true to character, he is immediately far more scared. He thinks he's going crazy, but it's all far too real. I really love some of the shots here, in this bathroom in particular. You gotta lay off the wacky tobacco. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Critic! <laughs> Why did you say all those mean things about me? You're not real. You're just a thing that's not very real. Oh, dear. Then I guess I wouldn't be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> So then Teddy Ruxpin jumps up and starts biting the critic's balls, 
Then a chase ensues, again all of this being pretty well shot, and even just a little bit creepy. The critic readies his bat, the bear grabs a knife before the critic then whacks him, only for the other caterpillar talking thing to go in and start biting his leg. <laughs> On my way, Teddy. <laughs> then Teddy goes in for the kill, and we get these random amusing shots of the bear attacking him before the critic finally is able to grab the knife and cut the head off of the Teddy. <laughs> Again, I love this shot here with the lighting effects. But it's not over yet, and the doll just reassembles itself and then puts a gun into the critic's mouth. Now, are you going to write another review, or am I gonna have to get nasty? Alright, alright, I'll do another review. <laughs> I knew you'd see it my way. <laughs> just, just answer me one thing. What the hell are you? You really want to know? I'm the devil! By the way, did anyone notice this split second JPEG shown here? I only just now noticed that after all these years when editing the video. Anyway, so the critic re-reviews the doll and then, well, this happens. I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't- HELP! HELP! The toy is alive! He's gonna kill me! He's gonna kill me! HELP! Who turned off the lights? Who turned off- Come dream with me tonight. Is that a FNAF reference? Talk about NostalgiaCritic.exe, am I right? This episode might have been very different from the norm for his show up to that point, but I really enjoyed it. It was a nice change of pace, and again, I remember loving this episode when I was a teen. To me, it shows that Doug had the potential to do some pretty cool skits for his videos. But of course, during this time, Doug was living with his parents, and in fact, the famous yellow-walled room he often reviewed things in was a massage room, since at that point his mom was a masseuse, and the desk that he always had his hands on and was hitting his head into was a massage table. I mention this because I think Doug, in some ways, had to work around his family's schedule if he was going to do skits outside that room or his own. All that to say, I think it was both economical and easier to get content out doing more simple videos. Which, to be fair to Doug, he was a content-making machine, making well over 100 videos in a year's time. And honestly, he still is a content-making machine to this day. So given all that, what Doug did here and what he was doing in general at this time was still very impressive even if that quantity sort of diluted the quality a bit in my opinion. The next review worth noting is the 1998 Godzilla review. Now, ever since I was a mere five-year-old, I have been a massive fan of the Godzilla series. He was my childhood hero, my endless inspiration. I'm a rather big fan of this big black beast, to say the least. Thus, growing up, I ended up watching the 90s TriStar Godzilla film and liked a fair bit. However, as I got older, I started to notice how different it was from the others, and I eventually started to see others' views of said film, including Doug's here in this video, as they lambasted it as an awful piece of garbage that disrespected Godzilla's good name and generally speaking was a bad film. Now these days, I think conversation about the film has changed a bit as many people now see it as an interesting look at a different take on Godzilla. And while maybe not the best Godzilla film, it's still a pretty damn good kaiju film. It's definitely silly, but I mean, most kaiju films are and I'm okay with that. I definitely fall into this latter camp, as I think the movie messes up the core idea of Godzilla being this indestructible being, with sacrifice, innovation, invention, or creativity sometimes all these things and more needed to beat the beast, rather than just trapping him on a bridge and shooting missiles at him because every other time you missed, I guess. But Godzilla rant aside, 
I will fully admit that at the point in which I watched this review, I kind of let others take on this film paint my perception of it as this awful thing that was a terrible insult to the franchise. This review being one of the big reasons for that. I guess what I'm saying is, the critics swayed my take on something that was finally nostalgic to me. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, mind you, but I'd like to take note of it now since there was an interesting culture that began to form around the critics' videos that I think few, besides those who were there, I suppose, may even be aware of. And even in retrospectives about Nostalgia Critic and That Guy of the Classes slash Channel Awesome in general, I've never really heard anyone Note the observation that I'm about to make. See, while these days Doug Walker and his work and his opinions are, well, let's just say are rather different for the sake of not going into that just yet, back in the day, the critics' reviews and the opinions there within held a lot of weight. Now, before you go scoffing at that, you gotta remember the scene at this point in time. Videos were finally starting to really become popular as a form of entertainment for many. But the people creating videos, especially high quality ones, were far, far fewer than they are today. On top of that, quality reviews of films, new or old, were even fewer and far between due to the copyright issues that basically made at doing such a thing on YouTube nearly impossible without it being a podcast type format. Thus, Doug, who remember, had to have his own dedicated website for this type of content to even exist, was in a rather unique position to be one of the only ones producing this type of content. One of the only ones who have an opinion others would see on these movies, period, in video form. Thus, when the critic had a video made on a topic or film, it used to be considered the definitive take on the film the definitive video on the subject, a de facto or otherwise. Now, in retrospect, this is rather funny since many of the takes in these videos are meant to be over the top and silly. And while the critic was occasionally genuinely analytical, it wasn't very often, if we're being honest. But nonetheless, they were still very influential. Perhaps profoundly so. Hell, the very idea of reviewing a film with clips to coincide with one's thoughts and criticisms for comedy or serious analysis alike, was practically invented by Doug. This structure, as simple as it is, is still being used to this very day. Even this video that you're watching right now has the DNA of that. Whenever I'm going over episodes or showing clips to display, an example of my point. I point all this out primarily to note just how significant he was as a creator, and why his opinions held a lot of weight at the time. In the time before there were thousands like him, a few hundred of those thousands being created due to indirect part of him giving them a platform, mind you. But uh, we'll get to that a bit later. Anyway, this review is okay. I do like the discussion of the ad campaign for this film keeping the design of Godzilla secret, and he does point out some of the logical flaws in the film, which is fair enough. He also makes a big deal about this joke where the Matthew Broderick character says there's a lot of fish to this army guy, and he just looks over at him in silence, and how he doesn't get what the joke is. He looks over at this amazing sight. That's a lot of fish. What? That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of... I don't get it. That's a lot of fish. So? I mean, is that meant to be funny? I love to pause at the end for the audience to laugh. I mean, but... What's the joke? I could have just as easily said... That's a hat! That's a wall! That's a lot of fish! I mean, how is that funny? You could have said a lot of things there, like, I got a fishy feeling about this. Or, it's like shooting fish in a barrel out here. I, I mean, it wouldn't have been funny, but at least they would have been actual jokes. That's a lot of fish. You could spend years trying to figure out why the hell that's supposed to be funny and not get anywhere. That's a lot of fish. Look, you could literally just put in gibberish. And that at least would have been a little bit funnier. 
He looks over this amazing sight, turns to the other guy and says, Poppity pop pop pop. And that actually will have gotten a little bit of a laugh. Just nonsense off the top of my head is funnier than these guys trying to willingly produce written humor. Think! Uh, the, uh, the joke is he was awkwardly pointing out the obvious. I mean, I suppose it's not all that funny, you know, but uh, it's also pretty obvious what the joke was, so... THANK! And the rest of the review, he just keeps bringing up that fish joke, and it never ever really gets funny, so, uh... Yeah, moving on, I guess. The next significant review, and the one that I remember fondly, was his Nicktoons review, where he reviews, in a quick fashion, several old Nickelodeon shows, and in general, is a retrospective on the channel. This was part of a three-part retrospective on that channel in January, which the critic dubbed as Nickelodeon Month. I absolutely loved this video back in the day, and I think it's still very good now. See, while reviewing movies is kind of his main shtick, I have always thought these retrospectives where he reviews and comes over the history of a channel, quickly talks about and riffs on some shows, and what it was like growing up with that stuff has always been his best stuff in the series. I think it's because it really uses the whole premise of the nostalgia critic to its fullest, going over large swabs of nostalgia. And generally the writing is a bit better when he doesn't have to spend most of it just summarizing the plot beats of a movie. This is why retrospectives and top 11 lists I think are some of the critics and Doug's best work when reviewing stuff. And generally speaking, I believe Doug excels when his writing, his quips, his content is shorter or in a sort of compilation type format. Which once again, I must point out that he was an innovator in. The idea of doing a Cartoon Channel retrospective, a look back at the history of this type of media was something he came up with that people are still doing to this very day through one means or another. I guess I should note that I can't actually prove that he came up with it, he is the one that popularized it. Maybe there's some other really obscure guy on YouTube or something during his time that uh, did it first, but if he did, I don't know him, so uh, I'm just gonna say that Doug invented it. This retrospective in particular really is great as he showcases several of the most iconic Nicktoons and presents both what made them stand out as well as his opinions on them. It was also pretty funny to see him riff on the Rugrats since that was a childhood favorite of mine growing up. I owned all the VHS tapes and I remember being so shocked when the new baby character introduced into the a Rugrats movie was named Dylan, or Dill for short. He of course points out that many of the plots are very low stakes and that it's a very silly premise for a cartoon, that being the adventures of babies, as well as a looking at it from an adult's perspective. I also really like this little skit about the show Doug. As growing up, I remember absolutely hating that show mainly because I thought it was super fucking boring. So seeing someone else all these years later riff on it was pretty funny. Plus, it was also when I first discovered his real name was Doug, which was also, I must admit, pretty funny. Well, let's just say you knew someone with a very similar name, someone who grew up with that name all his life, and happened to be raised at the exact same time this show came out. Do you think any jokes or funny remarks in connection with this show could possibly affect his life in any negative way? Do you? DO YOU?! <laughs> hey look, it's Doug Funny! Hey Doug Funny, where's Patty Mandy? Hey Doug Funny, on the way to school? You're Doug Funny, you're Doug Funny, you're Doug Funny, you're Doug Funny. Excuse me, I, uh, just having another one of my random psychotic episodes brought on by this fair show. Luckily, I, uh, did take anyone's life this time. <clears throat> but with that said... He also covered Nick at Night and what have you, but I think that you get the point. Now, the next episode worth mentioning is rather important, because it introduced two new elements to this series. One being this woman, at the time known as the Nostalgia Chick. Now, we haven't had time to talk about her yet, but all you need to know for now is she too would also end up making videos on this website. 
and that this was a collaboration between the two covering the animated film Fern Gully, which for the most part isn't really worth going into. Well, uh, besides the fact that they hit each other several times throughout the review. <laughs> Other than that, though, there is a rather famous, and in uh, some circles, infamous comment, critique made about this film, and I suppose, by extension, the film All Dogs Go to Heaven as well. Oh! It's a big lipped alligator moment. A big lipped alligator moment! What's a big lipped alligator moment? A big lipped alligator moment! Well, I mean, that's not an alligator, it's a. Uh, that's not an alligator! You stupid sack of shit. Perhaps you don't remember the big lipped alligator scene from All Dogs Go to Heaven. This is named after the random musical number sung by a big-lipped alligator towards the end of the film. A scene that comes right the fuck out of nowhere, has little to no bearing whatsoever on the plot, is way over the top in terms of ridiculousness, even within the context of the movie. And after it happens, no one ever speaks of it again. Oh, like the dancing fire gang from Labyrinth, the pink elephants from Dumbo, the creepy-ass tunnel scene from Willy Wonka. That's right. And now this festering pile of pointlessness. Yes, Critic, you're learning a lot today. I am. I really am. I hate everything about this. This big-lipped alligator moment comment would end up becoming a meme used not only by the critic and the girl critic, but pretty much everyone else on the site, and it even went beyond it and then on to general YouTube. This comment, this criticism, is created around the premise that this big-lipped alligator comes in, sings a song in the movie, and then is never brought up or important again. Thus, a big-lipped alligator moment is a pointless scene. And while you could argue that this scene is a bit random in that place in the movie, Hell, there is a few elements of that movie that are a bit random and maybe didn't need to have a musical number. The big-lipped alligator, you know, the one that's not supposed to show up and is never seen again in said movie, you know that one, the big-lipped alligator? Well, <laughs> what if I told you that, that the fucking big-lipped alligator does come back? Now, wouldn't that be the weirdest, wildest fucking thing ever? An ongoing joke that went on for fucking years was based on a fucking lie? Well, there he is. He comes back in the movie. Oh, and hey, he's directly important to the finale fight of the film, coming in to help our protagonist against the antagonist. Almost as if his inclusion wasn't RANDOM?! I have been sitting with this for years at this point. And while All Dogs Go to Heaven might not be the perfect movie, it is a damn good one that has gotten way, way too much shit over the years. Mostly by people who have never, ever watched the movie because the only thing they knew about it was that it was the movie with the big-lipped fucking alligator moment! <clears throat> Uh, I apologize for my outburst. I just can't stand it when lies are perpetrated for years. It, it hurts my very soul. On a more positive note, the next review is about the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog and the Sonic Sat AM cartoons. Now, before this, he had actually done a video on the Super Mario Super Show as well, but we stand Sonic in this household, so we're going to be talking about this one. And I must point out again that at this point in time, Doug had created some of, if not the very first video reviews of these video game cartoons. As someone who had recently gotten into Sonic Sat AM at that point in time and loved to lurk around the Fans United for Sat AM forums, this video at the time really spoke to me. 
mainly because he praises Sonic's Sad AM to hell and back as this amazing masterpiece of a cartoon, which, uh, I mean, duh, of course it is, while also kind of shitting all over the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, because while Sad AM was mature and told stories with real weight, had character development and actual stakes, the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog was more of a wacky Looney Tunes type affair, clearly meant to be a comedy and not to be taken very seriously. Now part of this, I think, can be chalked up to the critic character giving a funny reaction. But on the other hand, this is one of those times where I think he really did a disservice to the show, since while obviously Sad AM is better overall, in my opinion, both shows are also have very different goals in mind. Especially since Doug has said on multiple occasions how much he loves the Looney Tunes, with Daffy Duck even being considered one of his greatest inspirations, one of the best comedians to ever exist according to him, a lot of complaints levied toward this show, especially when it comes to his blatant cartoon logic, could also easily be said about the Looney Tunes as well. But, all well. Like I said though, it was pretty cool all the same to hear someone talk about a show I love so much. Hell, anytime anyone talked about something I actually grew up with or enjoyed at that time was extremely novel. Though as someone who had seen all of Sad AM, one thing I have started to notice is that Doug often seems to make criticisms out of a lack of understanding of the concept of a piece, or, more likely, lack of research. Such as when he asks this. I don't know, but either way I found out this character has kind of a cult following. But here's my question, if she's a princess, where's the king? They talk about him sometimes, but they mostly hint at the fact that he's probably dead. So shouldn't she be in charge now? I know he's alive. I just don't know where. You're not really a princess. You just took the title because it sounds cute. Take some authority! You're a queen! Queen it up, bitch! They don't all have to look like Elizabeth II, you can still be pretty, but start moving forward and take some responsibility! The furries will respect you for it. Now, you see, if you only ever saw a few episodes of the show, particularly the ones from season one, I think this would be a question you would have. But, if you did happen to watch all the show, including the stuff from Season 2, including, oh, you know, the two-part backstory episode where it's revealed where the king is, who he is, and why things are the way they are, then, uh, this comment wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, now would it? Sort of like if someone had watched all the way through All Dogs Go to Heaven before making a brash criticism and ongoing joke, they would have known that the alligator indeed does come back. Hmm, now that I think about it, this is becoming a bit of a theme. You might even call it a big lack of research moment. Okay, so I could go over quite a few more videos he made, both the good and the bad, and the meh. Pointing out if I find something he said that could be funny, or dumb, or otherwise. But I think we've well covered the major points that I want to talk about. The strengths and weaknesses and general significance of these videos from the first and formative year of ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com, and why this series is both flawed yet so innovative at the exact same time. But before we move on, during this first year of That Guy With The Glasses being up, Doug would end up creating exactly 11 top 11 list videos, which, as I have said, I believe to be some of his best content in this series. And so, you might already know where this is going, this is my top 11, top 11 critic videos from the first year, starting with number 11, top 11 naughtiest Animaniacs moments. This one isn't bad, it's not why it's at the bottom, but it's also just two minutes of random adult jokes uh, from the show with pretty much no commentary from the critic. So yeah, I, I couldn't justify putting it any higher than the bottom. Number 10, the top 11 dumbest Superman moments. This one is all right, but it's mostly just pointing out obvious stuff like, how does no one recognize Clark Kent as Superman? Or how the hell does he manage to turn back time rotating the earth back, etc, etc. It's pretty basic stuff, and while it's all fair, and maybe at the time not as many people had said this stuff through video form, there's not all that much that's interesting here as a list in my opinion. 
Number 9, Top 11 Mindfucks. I actually really like the concept of this list, that being a showcase of moments of nostalgic media that is trippy or really cool and crazy. There's also a fair bit of lol random humor between each entry on this list, uh, as was customary for the time. But that being said, this one gets knocked down a few pegs mainly due to him going on about some of these being big-lipped alligator moments. And I get that's all part of the joke, but I feel like every time this meme is used, it actively got people to start looking animated films in a kind of weird and cynical light. Since you often get weird and trippy scenes or visuals in an animated film because, oh well, you know, it's one of the strengths of animation. I mean, just look at this stuff. You couldn't do this in live action. And instead of seeing the artistry or anything behind it, for a while, it was just, look at that big lip alligator moment. It, uh, it really spoiled the stew as far as animation conversations went, as far as I'm concerned, for quite a few years. And I'm afraid I'm far too much of a nerd with animation and my love for it that anytime this meme gets brought up, it kind of sours me to the video. Number 8. Top 11 Catchiest Nostalgia Theme Songs This one is pretty good, even if most of these outside of like DuckTales and the Warner Bros. cartoons like Tiny Toons and the Animaniacs, etc. I didn't ever really like grow up watching. It's still a pretty good list, mind you. It also started the ongoing joke of him bringing up the DuckTales theme song as a consistent pestering song that will never leave him. You think you're trying to answer the questions on your math test, but nope, all you're thinking about is DuckTales! You think you're playing basketball with your teammates, but nope, all you're thinking about is DuckTales! You think you're about to achieve enlightenment. The pearly gates of knowledge are opening up, and all the secrets of the universe are about to be revealed. But no! All you're thinking about is DuckTales! It will never leave, it will never leave! He also says this line when talking about G.I. Joe. This is back in the day when the worst terrorist we had to deal with was Cobra. <sighs> God, I miss Cobra. When he threatened us, it was funny. When the real terrorists threaten us, it's just creepy. Uh, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> Number 7. Top 11 Drug PSAs This one's pretty dang good. You know, for a time it seemed like every popular YouTuber or internet personality would eventually do a video where they poke fun at drug PSAs through some form or another. I suppose that comes from the fact that so many of these early creators grew up with these super over-the-top commercials and PSAs so it's a funny thing to look back on and review just how silly or creepy they could be. There's a lot of pretty good commentary here from the critic as well, which again I think comes from the subject matter really lending itself well to funny commentary. This also seems like a precursor of sorts to a very popular series of videos that would come years later, but I'll save talking about those till we get there. Number 6. Top 11 Hottest Animated Women this video is great 100% because of how it has aged. On one hand, you really couldn't make a video like this today. I mean, you could, but you'd probably be a big fat fucking laughing stock at this point. Unless you played it right, I suppose. On the other hand, it's Doug talking about all these animated girls who he wants to fuck. Well, I mean, that is that he wanted to do that whenever he was a teen, you see. Except, nah, he still wants to based on the actual commentary in the video. I mean, if nothing else, I guess it's an honest, uh, bit of commentary. And has some, shall we say, interesting foreshadowing to a controversy that will come up later. Sailor Moon from, well, Sailor Moon. I have to admit, I put her pretty low on this list because I found this show just so goddamn annoying. Even when I was a kid, I thought this show sucked. I mean, the story makes no sense, the characters are all morons, and they keep using the same chunks of animation over and over. However, if there were chunks of animation that they had to use over and over, it would definitely be the transformation scenes. I mean, damn. This is like an intergalactic striptease. For those who know, you know and we'll get to it eventually. And for those who don't, well, you're in for something later. Number 5. Top 11 Nostalgic Animated Shows 
This video is just an overall pretty good top 11 list, consisting of the critic praising a bunch of stuff from the past instead of shitting on it for a change. There is still some witty bits of commentary here and there, or at least for the time. See, something I have had to wrap my brain around a bit with these lists and his older content in general is this overwhelming feeling of, duh, yeah, way to point out the obvious which a lot of his commentary is just pointing out the obvious and throwing shade slash yelling at it. But one must also remember that he was also one of the very first people to ever make these obvious points about this stuff via video format anyway. Which is to say, they might not have been so obvious back then. Or if they were, there wasn't anyone who existed yet to point them out. So that you as a viewer can say, yeah, I always thought that. So bearing that in mind, a lot of these lists for the most part have been pretty good at quickly showcasing something cool, weird, or otherwise and cutting down to the basics, the core of the thing that anyone can understand. While looking at it by today's standards, it's a bit thin on real meat, you might say. There isn't much there as far as analysis, insightful, interesting, or unique takes or really anything that you haven't heard before, but for the time these videos were definitely influential and popular for a reason. And there were also plenty of times where Doug did point out stuff and showcase things that maybe not a lot of people was even aware of, be they someone who grew up during this time or not, which I think regardless is always very, very cool. Number four, top 11 saddest nostalgic moments. This was definitely one of the more interesting lists and one that I always remember when thinking back about Nostalgia Critic videos. Since, as a kid, there were two things that always stuck out in my mind when it came to movies. That being villains and sad scenes. There's a lot of good picks here, and while the whole fake crying bit is a little silly and gets uh, pretty old quickly, I do like the concept of this list a lot, though if we're talking about tear jerkers, he put Disney films as number one. But I would actually say that a former pick, one of his earlier picks in the list, The Land Before Time, is sadder in my uh, opinion. Mainly because it lasts longer, Littlefoot has to walk around without his mother, seeing her shadow in the rocks, and that scene when Littlefoot talks to the lone dinosaur, Rooter, about his mom's death. First blaming his mother for dying, then blaming himself for her death, is all so realistically written and fucking stabs me in the heart every single time. Especially when the rough and grouchy Rooter realizes why the kid's upset and immediately softens his voice to comfort him and give him some good life advice. Hits me every time, man. That being said, I don't want to stray too far off topic, but uh... Yeah, number three, top 12 greatest Christmas specials. So it's no secret to anyone who has watched Doug Walker's content for a while that he absolutely loves Christmas and Christmas media in particular. This will become an ever ongoing thing with him, going to absolutely cartoonish heights in later seasons. And this was the first of those types of videos to really showcase that even making a top 12 list because he just loves it so much. This list video also being about 7 minutes longer than the average list video at this point as well. And I think that's because this was a topic he was clearly passionate about and a lot more to say about with each entry. His passion is a bit infectious, I'll admit. Hell, I know it's in fashion to be a cynical fuck when it comes to talking about Christmas time and the music and the specials, etc. Actually, it's kind of always been in fashion to be a cynical fucking jerk about just about everything these days. Uh, but I am an enjoyer of Christmas things. So this was a fun list to watch through. Also, the bit with the little tree puppet was actually pretty funny. But most of all, I love... I think I better bow out. <laughs> oh. This movie really knows how... I need to pack my trunk. <laughs> that was annoying. They call I called a
Okay, your novelty is wearing off, Trudy. You're hanging on by a thread. And that's the... <laughs> I've always been a singer, but I'm at a joke. I'm branching out. Get it? <laughs> All right, Trudy. You talk one more time. I'm going to put a bullet in your head and call it macaroni. I guess I haven't really noted this yet, but one of Doug's signature forms of comedy and just the way he presents himself on screen is with his extremely emotive expressions. Like this dude can look like a straight up nut in some screenshots, and his expressions can be pretty funny or at the very least reaction image worthy. I don't even mean this in a bad way, but Doug Walker really reminds me of a cartoon character. The way he bends and contorts his face, his over-the-top screaming and general body movements. He's like an animated movie villain. He has a strange aura about him that makes him pretty natural at this sort of stuff as well. It's like he was genetically designed to be a campy, over-the-top B-movie villain. That being said, you put him in any other role and I'm not so sure that overacting would be very helpful especially for anything that's a bit more subtle. But as an animated Disney villain given fleshy human form, yeah, that's your guy. And speaking of villains, number two, top 11 Disney villains. So this list is funny because I picked it for number two because I love these types of lists. As I've noted before, I love animated villains. There's something about the way a good animated villain is drawn that Ever since I was a kid, just just activated the marbles up there in my brain, you know? I like them. I like looking at them. I like hearing them say cool, evil, wild shit. I like hearing them sing. I like seeing their capes fly to and throw, you know? You get what I'm saying? Anyway, this was the first video I was ever aware of that made a big deal about Disney villains. And so it has always stuck out in my mind for that reason alone. And it was definitely a favorite of mine back in the day. These days it's still pretty decent, but I really don't agree with some of the placements. Like shitting all over Scar by saying he becomes uninteresting after he obtains power, which is just blatantly not true and misses the entire point of the character being ill fit for power. I do appreciate the inclusion of Radican though, and the top choice, while a bit odd and not something that I would personally pick, being Chernabog from Fantasia is still all the same, pretty interesting and unconventional choice. But anyway, on to the number one pick. Number one, top 11 underrated nostalgic classics. Now this is one that I will fully admit is a bit important to me. You see, the video itself is really quite nice, especially because it was one of the critics' earlier videos. This was one of the first times we get to hear the critic, or Doug's, sincere thoughts towards things that he likes. Things he thinks should get more attention, and well, I suppose he did do just that in some small way. I remember growing up, my mom used to tape whatever the next animated film or a kid-friendly film was going to be each week, uh, be it on Disney Channel or otherwise. It was always her way of showing me things that she grew up with while also letting me discover new things on my own as well. After a while, I had quite the collection of VHS tapes recorded from TV spots. And it was here I first discovered a film titled The Secret of Nim. Now, this wasn't the first time I had run into Don Bluth's works, far from it actually, as I had actually grown up with The Land Before Time, An American Tale, and eventually The Pebble and the Penguin, and All Dogs Go to Heaven later on. But I was a kid, and I didn't really know that all these things were directed by the same guy. Though, my brain perhaps did, if that makes any sense. Anyway, I watched Secret of Nim, and I remember feeling like it was a very mysterious movie. I could tell it was a bit darker than some of the other stuff I had seen, and there was something about it that stuck out in my mind, like a sort of distant memory after I had finished it. Well, point here being that this video reintroduced me to that film with it being the number one underrated classic on his list. And as soon as he started talking about it, the passionate way that he does here, I was immediately reminded of that film that I hadn't seen for so very, very long. And I ended up going and watching it and enjoying it all the more as a teen in ways I just couldn't appreciate when I was a little kid watching it. In fact, I loved it so much, I became obsessed with looking more into the man who made it 
Don Bluth, and his various other films I had grown up with, and some that I hadn't, like Rockadoodle, for example. And he's one of my favorite animated directors and biggest inspirations to me to this very day. And while I might have eventually come to that direction on my own, I'd be lying if I didn't give Doug some credit for reintroducing this movie to me, as well as I suppose my mom for showing them to begin with. And the more I thought about it, the more I kind of realized that this is exactly the kind of thing this series, about nostalgia, about looking back at the past, is capable of. It's not just a man cynically calling out the stupid shit from old movies, he and others grew up with, is also remembering the films that captured our young imaginations. The stuff that leaves a mark that you can appreciate all the more as an adult looking back. And I think that that is pretty damn cool. So it takes my number one spot for that reason alone. So now that we've talked about this series and the first year of That Guy with the Glasses, it's time we talk about the Year One Anniversary Special. It would become customary moving forward for a while that at the end of each year of uh, the ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com, Doug would make this big celebration event, sort of like a season finale of sorts to top off the year. Some of these even being movies that, uh, well, again, we're not there yet. At any rate, after a big year of tons, and I do mean tons of content being made, as in over 100 videos of content in a year type of tons, we have two more videos to top off the year. Firstly, with this video entitled Birthday, where Doug, Rob, and the other That Guy of the Glasses fellas all awkwardly celebrate and do a silly little video as well as allude to a, a bigger event and video coming, as well as poking fun at some of uh, the not so popular sketches and ideas that they did this year. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> I thought you were some homeless person. <laughs> Did you ever think we'd make it this far? No, no, I didn't, Fargo. Thanks for the optimism. Prick. So what are you going to do for your one-year anniversary, Doug? Oh, I have plans, Rob. I have plans. You don't have any plans, do you? No, no, I don't. Seriously, though, one year, that's just so cool and everything. I want to say that, you know, the uh, big event that all you guys sent the money for and everything, uh, everyone's asking, where's the event? Where's the event? Well, we kind of spent it all on Melvin. You know, I mean, that was a very expensive uh, costume and makeup and everything. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm glad you guys liked it so much, though. So, people, if you want to see the extended cut of Melvin, the greatest sketch on our site, Donate now, we need more money. This all eventually leads into this season finale, where the critic is seen atop a building, doing what else but singing. There's a bright sunny day in Chicago. There's a bright sunny day in Chicago. Corruptions as high as an elephant's eye. And the meters cost seventy four twenty five. Oh, what an adequate morning! Oh, what an adequate day! I got an adequate feeling Everything's going my way Oh, what a- FUCK ME! Before he is then interrupted by the appearance of an all too familiar bespeckled nemesis. <laughs> yep, that's right, you thought it was over. No, this is actually the super secret final final battle between the nerd and the critic. The two exchange blows and chase each other down the building and into a different one, up an elevator and into a big room where the critic is then assisted by none other than the Nostalgia Chick. Nostalgia 
Come on, critic. Let's kick ass and get cynical. But wait, the nerd has some friends too. The behind the couch guy, also known as Kyle Justin, comes in to smite the two critics with his mighty guitar. Kyle Justin of KyleJustinMusic.com! But then, none other than the legendary Linkara joins the battle to assist the critics with his blunder bus pistol thing. Hold it! Let the wussy go! Yeah? What the hell are you gonna do about it? I am a man! But wait, then Benzai comes in. But it seems, even though he is on the That Guy with the Glasses website, that he has taken the nerd side, since as he puts it, he is a gamer first and a friend second. Then Handsome Tom and 8-Bit Mickey from Screw Attack join the fray. The gamers are truly rising up. But it seems Tom is upset at Benzai for challenging him at Street Fighter. Then the Little Miss Gamer from PVC Productions, as seen in the Internet Fables episode 4 in Captain S, comes in. Then Spoonie comes in and fucking uppercuts the Little Miss Gamer. <laughs> then Mars Girl comes in, and then Angry Joe, and well, I'll just let the rest of the thing play out. Don't worry, NC. I got it for ya. Mars Girl! Ah! Angry Joe! The epic fail guy! Sean? Whatever! It's Gamers United, Critic, and that chick with the goggles is ready to bring it. Isn't that right, Lee? You too, Lee from Still Gaming? What can I say, Critic? You threaten one gamer, you threaten us all. The same can be said for reviewers, my friend. Huh? You threaten one of us, you threaten all of us. Then we will see who will emerge triumphant. Won't we, that chick with the goggles? So much for talking. Arr! Mati from Captain Planet. Ah, uh, I can sense you all. Leave that little Indian Mexican thing alone. Art. And all reviewers, get on this side. Move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. Ah! All gamers on this side. Now line up, you goddamn geeky bastards. So then the sides are taken. Gamers versus critics, and both leaders make their speeches to their groups readying themselves for the ultimate confrontation. Then we have an extended sequence of punch, sound effects, and the like, with all the gamers and critics and internet personalities alike duking it out. There are some pretty funny interactions here to be fair, including Bennett the Sage and Spoonie setting up a catfight, the podcast people of thatguyoftheglasses.com, like Cold Guy, who is also the one that kind of was instrumental in this whole thing happening to begin with between the nerd and the critic, might I add, doing commentary over the battle, Angry Joe making fucking dumb kung fu noises before the critic just straight up kills him on the spot, etc. <laughs> and of course, the nostalgia chick also uses her signature move. It all plays out like a big old cartoon fight, but it's all old internet personalities. But hey, what's the difference, am I right? But anyway, then Chester A. Bum comes in to help the critic, and then the nerd and the critic run across the room firing their weapons at one another, somehow without either of them hitting each other. Then fucking Super Mecha Death Christ comes in, as well as something big. Giant robotic Donkey Kong Jesus riding above the smoke. So the two Jesus related monsters start fighting each other in a big PNG kaiju fight. And then they both run into each other and blow up uh, before the fight then continues as normal. Until. The best fucking character comes in and tells everyone to hold it.
Now, I may not claim to know everything, but there are some things that I know for sure. And war is never the answer. You two, do you even remember what you were fighting about all this time? No. Then why are we all fighting? This isn't a time for violence. This is a time for unity. For everybody to bring their creativity together to create something new and better. And all you other gamers and reviewers, there isn't any war to be fought or even any winners to be had. Only losers. You know he's right. We shouldn't hate each other. We should join forces to hate other things. Maybe we can do a review. I would like that. In fact, I think there's a lot of you who want to do crossovers, aren't there? Because everybody really eats that shit up. Yeah! yeah. People, let's join together and take a picture to show everybody how truly united we are. Not you, Mati. Well, here's to whatever the hell we review, critic. He got it, Larry. Smile, everybody. Ending this season with a bang before we then get the big credit section letting us know who the hell all these people are. And uh, speaking of which, I'm sure there's a fair few of you that recognize some of the names here, some who might even be nerdy enough to know all of the people and internet folks that were here. But I also bet there's a fair few of you who are probably asking at this very moment a pretty legitimate question. Uh, especially if you came into this retrospective only knowing a little bit about Nostalgia Critic lore or maybe not even anything at all. And that question is, who the fuck are all these people? To which, well, lucky for you, my dear viewer, I just so happen to have the answer. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you enjoyed part one of the Channel Awesome Retrospective. This one's been a long time coming. Ever since I finished my AVGN Retrospective, I knew that this was going to be one of the next big retrospective projects that I wanted to tackle. Part two will take a bit of time, mind you, as it will be covering basically every single person that came to join thatguyoftheglasses.com during the first and second year, which is a lot of people and content to cover. We're talking Linkara content uh, during that time. Spoonie, Nostalgia Chick, Angry Joe, Benzai, Mars Girl, Bennett the Sage, etc, etc. While some of them made more content than others, it's still a lot of stuff to watch and write about. And my hope is that by the end of part two, you will be familiar with every single online character that shows up within the film Kigassia, which part three will focus on. All of this to say, it's a big video, so expect it to take a bit of time before it's fully finished. Speaking of which, on the 21st of this month, I'll also be streaming the Kigassia film here on YouTube for anyone who wants to join in for a bit of fun. I'll also be having a bit of a Q&A regarding Nostalgia Critic, this video, and the channel going forward. I am also going to start streaming my progress through the various That Guy of the Glasses internet people on my Discord server, so if you want to join in for some fun and get a bit of a behind the scenes look as I work my way through this massive catalog of content, you can either become a patron or a channel member for just $2 and you can become a Night Egg, which gives you access to the Discord server and helps the channel out. Every little bit helps, and it's sure to be a fun time. And speaking of that, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members, including all of my Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as my great Night Owls, including Channel 11, Hexmaniac Hanna, Honeyteer Maya, Justice, Hohot, Medusa's Hex, and Star Punch Gaming as well as a super duper big thank you to all of my Arch Owls 
including the Gun Toten Thursday 14, the Fearless Forgotten Ace, the Super Saiyan Sword, the Wise Daniel and Talented Doggy NGT, and the Good Chi Vibe Zen Garden Party. And with all that said, thank you all so very much for watching this video. If you have any memories regarding that guy of the glasses.com, Nostalgia Critic, or any of the people that you know I'm going to be covering very soon on this channel, uh, be sure to comment down below. And until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.